Amish Regrets. Copyright 2014 by Samantha Price. All rights reserved. Chapter 1. Ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Matthew chapter 7 verses 7 to 8. It's your turn next, Sylvie whispered to Emma once the bishop pronounced their friends Angela and Robert man and wife. Yeah, it's not far away now. Emma smiled and looked lovingly over at her husband-to-be, Will. They'd finally set a date just two months away, and now with Angela out of her house, Emma could concentrate on her own wedding day. Where's Sabrina? I thought she'd be here, Emma said. She hasn't shown up to anything of late. I've a good mind to send her packing back to Ohio. Now that she's not under Mam and Dad's eyes, she thinks she can do anything she likes. She hasn't even been to the last few Sunday meetings. I wouldn't be surprised if the bishop stopped by to have a talk with her. What's she doing then? I thought she was looking for a husband, so wouldn't she attend everything she could, especially a wedding? Look at all the single men are here. Sylvie looked around. Yeah, that's true. I wonder what she's been up to. I'm going to have to take more notice of her comings and goings. Maybe we should spy on her, follow her. Emma giggled, then leaned close to Sylvie and whispered, From what you said of your mother she'll blame you if Sabrina gets into any trouble. She is your younger sister after all. What Emma said about Sabrina getting into trouble preyed on Sylvie's mind, and was the reason she left the wedding celebrations early. Why hadn't she thought of it herself? It was clear, now that Emma had pointed it out to her, that Sabrina was up to something. But what? Sabrina freely admitted to being in Lancaster County solely to look for a husband, so why wasn't she at Angela's wedding, a perfect place to find such a man? Sylvie had been so caught up in her own long wait for Bailey, the man she loved to become Amish, that she had completely ignored her duty as big sister. Whatever would her mother think of her? While her horse clip-clopped home in the dark with the mandatory lights of the buggy flashing, Sylvie recalled that Sabrina had been out and about nearly every day of the past week. Sylvie had been so pleased to have some time to herself that she never thought to ask Sabrina where she went. The truth was that she hadn't cared where she was. That was before she considered that she might be doing things she shouldn't be doing. As Sylvie drew closer to home, she was surer than ever that her sister Sabrina was secretly dating an Englisher. Nothing else fit. That had to be it. Anger rose within Sylvie as she recalled that just recently Sabrina told her she was disappointed in her for being in love with Bailey because he was an Englisher. Calm down. There could be a logical explanation. Maybe she's sick, and that's why she didn't go to the wedding. Sylvie's body trembled in anger. Well, she had better be sick, Sylvie told herself. Once Sylvie had the horse rubbed down and safely in his stable, she headed into the house to see what she could find out about what was going on with Sabrina. Sylvie had given Sabrina the downstairs bedroom, which had its own outdoor access. Sylvie realized it had been a mistake to give her a room from which she could come and go as she pleased. Sylvie would have no idea what time she was coming home, or whether she was sneaking out after she'd come home. Sylvie lit one of the gas lanterns, opened Sabrina's bedroom door and peeped in. There was no sign of her. Sabrina would have known that Sylvie would have been home very late that night. Maybe Sabrina thought she could slip home unnoticed at a late hour. She had a good look around Sabrina's room. Nothing seemed out of place. Sylvie felt sick to her stomach and decided to help herself to a small glass of the fortified wine, which she only kept for medicinal purposes. She walked into the utility room, stretched onto her tiptoes and reached to the back of the highest shelf. Once she poured some of the dark fluid into a small glass, she sank into the couch and put the glass to her lips. Her body flooded with warmth after one sip. Oh God, what am I to do? She asked in desperation. She knew that God was the only answer. He could help her with her problems with Sabrina. The more she thought about it, the more she realized there was a problem, as things with Sabrina just didn't add up. She was angry with herself for not realizing before now, and angry with herself that it needed Emma to point it out to her. There was nothing she could do but wait until Sabrina came home, and then she would confront her with her suspicions. 
Sylvie was drifting off to sleep on the lounge, then jolted awake when her head tipped down suddenly. She looked up at the china clock on the sideboard. It was ten past twelve. The clock reminded her of John, her late husband. She thought of him less and less as the years passed. It wasn't a bad marriage, and Sylvie had grown to love John over the years. She did miss being married and having a man to care for. She hoped that Bailey would fill that gap in her life before too long. The low hum of a car's engine outside her front door snapped Sylvie out of her daydreams. She flung the door open to see Sabrina racing towards her. She collapsed in Sylvie's arms and the taxi sped back up the driveway. What's the matter with you, Sabrina? Sabrina pushed Sylvie inside, shut the door behind them and then sank to the floor. He's dead, he's dead. Chapter 2 And rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Joel chapter 2 verse 13 Sylvie sank to the floor beside her sister. Who, Sabrina? Who's dead? Carmelo. Carmelo's dead. Sylvie searched her memory banks for someone named Carmelo and came up with a blank. She was sure that she'd never heard of anyone who went by that name. Her next question was one that she wasn't sure she wanted to know the answer to. Who's Carmelo? Sabrina looked up at her through tear-filled blue eyes. My boyfriend. He's my boyfriend, his name's Carmelo. Sabrina sobbed uncontrollably as she sprawled herself out on the floor. Sylvie's heart began to pound fast. Carmelo was no Amish name, that was for sure and for certain. Sabrina's boyfriend was an Englisher, her suspicions were correct. What would their mother think when she got to hear about it? There was only one thing to do, and that was to try and conceal everything from their mother for as long as they possibly could. But did Sabrina say this Carmelo man was dead? You mean dead dead? Not alive? Sylvie asked. Sabrina lifted her head, looked at her, and then her mouth downturned and she sobbed louder. I'm sorry, Sabrina. Try and stand. Come over to the couch. Sylvie lifted Sabrina to the couch and handed her a handkerchief to wipe her tear-drenched face. After a time, Sabrina's sobs lessened enough so that she was able to speak. I found him dead, Sabrina managed to say. Don't try to talk for a while. I'll get you a glass of water. Sylvie hurried to the kitchen and came back to hand Sabrina the water. Sabrina held the glass in both hands and wobbled it to her lips with shaky hands. She managed to drink a little. That's good. Now tell me about it when you're ready. Sylvie patted her on her shoulder. Sabrina looked into Sylvie's eyes. Ah, it was terrible, just terrible. She placed the glass on the table and covered her face with both hands. Carmelo and I arranged to meet, and when he wasn't at our usual place, I went to his office and found him dead. He was just lying there. Did you call the police? Sabrina looked down into her hands. I heard someone coming so I hid in the adjoining office until they left, then I slipped out. How did he die? I don't know I didn't wait to find out. Who was it who came when you were hiding? His wife. What? Sylvie felt her stomach lurch. Things were much, much worse than she ever could have imagined in a trillion years. Did you say wife? So Carmelo was married? He was separated. He was trying to get a divorce, but she didn't want a divorce unless he gave her everything. He finally agreed to give her what she wanted, and she was to sign papers tonight. Sylvie wanted to ask what she was doing involved with an Englisher and a married one at that, but what was done was done. Sylvie knew Sabrina would be in no state of mind to listen to any straight-talking common sense right now. She would have to wait for a time when Sabrina would be more receptive. Nevertheless, Sylvie wanted to shake Sabrina for being so stupid. I'll make you a cup of tea. Sylvie wrapped the crocheted throw that she kept near the couch over Sabrina's shoulders. Keep that around you. You've had a nasty shock, I've heard it does you good to keep warm. Sabrina's sobs lessened to snivels and sniffs. Sylvie rushed to make the tea, glad she had taken a little of the medicinal wine before Sabrina arrived home. She put two spoons of sugar in Sabrina's tea and hurried back to the living room with it, hoping Sabrina would soon be able to tell her the whole story from the beginning. 
Here, drink this, it'll make you feel better. Danka. Sabrina took a sip of tea, then set the cup down on the saucer. Do you feel up to telling me how all this happened? Sabrina nodded and lifted her eyes to the ceiling. I met Carmelo when I was in a coffee shop in town. We just got to talking. Things went from there. Things what things exactly? Do I have to spell everything out for you? You're over 30. You should know a bit about life. You know what I mean. We were having a relationship. Sabrina's words were snapped and angry, but Sylvie knew that she was scared and trying to keep up a front. Sylvie reminded herself that it was no time for a lecture, and knew she had to show kindness and empathy. After all, who was she to judge? She knew how hard it was when she fell in love with Bailey, even though he was no Amish man. Did his wife call the ambulance and the police? I left when the wife left. How did you know he was dead? Sometimes people can look dead but they can be unconscious. His eyes were open and just staring, Sabrina said before she jumped up and ran outside. Sylvie heard the noises of Sabrina throwing up, so she went into the kitchen and wet a cloth. Sylvie sat on the front doorstep and waited until Sabrina finished. Sabrina sat on the ground after she had finished. Here. Sylvie handed Sabrina the damp cloth then helped her back into the house. Feel a bit better? I don't know how I feel. I'm just numb. I checked to see whether he was really dead, and he was. He wasn't breathing, and I felt for his heart and it wasn't beating. Sylvie knew it was important to ask Sabrina as many questions as she could right away, even though Sabrina might not want to answer any. Come back inside. It's getting a little cold. Once they were both back on the couch. Sylvie said, you probably don't feel like answering any questions but it's important you tell me all you can remember. We were to meet at the little place where we always met. When he was half an hour late, I knew there was something wrong. He's never late. I went to where he worked, figuring he might still be busy. I could see from the road outside that his office light was still on. I went up there. Everything was unlocked. I opened his door and peeked into his office, and he was right there on the floor, dead. Right in front of the door. Sabrina dabbed the damp cloth all over her face. I thought at first that he was playing a joke on me. He always does silly things like that. I told him to get up and that he wasn't fooling me. I scolded him for leaving me waiting. When he didn't answer me or didn't laugh, I feared the worst and reached down and touched him. After a long pause Sylvie asked, then what? I heard someone calling his name. I hid in the other office and closed the door. I didn't hear her scream or anything. She stayed there for a few minutes then left. Did you scream when you saw him? Me because I thought he was joking, playing a prank. When I realized he wasn't, I just froze. I hid when I heard someone coming, because I didn't want anyone to know about me. We were keeping things a secret until his divorce, then we were going to be together. Carmelo didn't want anyone to know about me yet. If you were hiding in the other office, how did you know that it was his wife who came into his office? I looked out the window after she left and I saw her cross the street. It was her. Where had you seen her before? The first time I saw her was at the coffee shop that I mentioned. It was before I met him, in fact the first time I laid eyes on him. I could tell they were having an argument and trying to keep their voices down. I got up to leave and she got up to leave at the same time, and then she bumped into me and called me a stupid religious freak and stormed out. She caused me to overbalance, and I knocked into the table where he was still sitting. Carmelo apologized for what she had said, and that's how we got to talking. That's how we met. How long's it been going on? I met him just days after I arrived here. I think it was the first time you let me take the buggy by myself. You should tell the police that you found him, Sylvie said, hoping that Sabrina would not throw up again. I can't do that. I hid. What would I say to them? I'll leave it up to you, but I really think you should tell them everything you know. I'll look like I'm guilty because I hid when the wife came. Guilty of what? Are you worried about having an affair with a married man, or having people think that you killed him? You think he was killed? 
Sabrina asked. We don't know. You probably should have stayed and been the one to call the police, then you would have found everything out. Sabrina said he was perfectly healthy. He looked after himself. I'll call the police if you think I should. I think it'd be a good idea. I'll walk up the road to the phone with you. Sylvie had no phone of her own. Driving to a friend's house or using a public phone was the only option, and considering the late hour, the best option was the public phone up the road. Can it wait till morning? Sabrina asked. Nay, and rather than call them, I think what we should do is drive to the police station, and then you can tell them everything you know. Sabrina nodded. I suppose nothing worse can happen than has already happened. After Sylvie and Sabrina arrived at the police station, two policemen sat with Sabrina as they prepared to listen to what she had to say. Would you like a lawyer? One of the policemen asked. Sylvie's eyes opened widely. She hasn't done anything. Why would she need one? We're counting Mr. Leonte's death as suspicious. It could well have been murder. We won't know for sure for a few more hours. Sabrina told them everything she knew, about how she found Carmelo and hid when Mrs. Leonte arrived, and then looked out the window to see her leave. Sylvie sat with Sabrina while the police asked questions. The sisters looked at each other often as Sabrina gave her answers. Some tiring hours later, Sabrina and Sylvie were in the buggy driving back home. It's strange that they knew nothing of the wife coming to see him. Are you sure it was she who you saw? Sabrina nodded. Sylvie continued, I overheard one of them say they had just gone around to the Leontes' house to tell Mrs. Leonte, and she was very distressed. Sabrina shrugged. I know. I heard them say that too. She's acting like she didn't know that he was already dead. That doesn't add up. If she'd been in his office when he was lying there on the floor, she would have already known that he was dead. They said that the janitor found him. That means that after she saw him, she didn't phone the paramedics or the police. Am I having a bad dream? This all doesn't seem real, Sabrina covered her face with her hands. I know, if it is, I'm having the same bad dream as you. Sylvie considered her bad dream was that she'd get the blame from her parents about what Sabrina had been up to. They would blame her for not keeping a closer eye on her, and they would blame her double when they found out about Bailey, her Englisher man whom she was in love with. They would claim that she'd set a bad example for Sabrina. Sylvie wondered whether that were true. Had she set a bad example for her sister by falling in love with an Englisher? Even though she was a grown woman, her parents still treated her as a child. I'm sorry, Sabrina, if my entertaining the idea of Bailey joining the community had anything to do with you seeing Carmelo. Nay, Sylvie, it had nothing to do with it. Why would you think that? It was nothing that I planned. I never would have thought I'd fall in love with someone like Carmelo. The heart wants what the heart wants. Sylvie frowned. Where did you hear that from? Carmelo used to say it all the time. Do you think that they will tell Carmelo's wife about me? Sylvie made a face. I hope not. They were separated, weren't they? Sylvie considered that it might make things slightly better if the two were officially separated, before Sabrina began her relationship with the man. Yeah. He told me that they were separated, but they still lived in the same house until he got the documents signed. I think in the end he agreed to what she wanted, so he could get divorced without waiting any longer. Maybe she was entitled to everything. Do you know how these things work? Sylvie asked. Sabrina shook her head. I know nothing of these things. All I know is that Carmelo would not have lied to me. He was the nicest man who has ever walked this earth. What did he say about your faith? He obviously knew you were Amish by your clothing. He asked a lot of questions if that's what you mean. Did he speak of marriage with you? Sylvie asked. Nay, but he was in love with me. We would have got married, I'm certain of it. I just know it, and that's why we didn't have to speak about it. Under the circumstances, Sylvie considered that it was no use telling Sabrina anything contrary to what she currently believed. What good would it do to talk sense into her when the man in question was dead? Sabrina broke down as they drew closer to home. 
it's all my fault. God is punishing me because I sinned. Now Carmelo is dead and it's all my fault. Don't be upset. God doesn't punish people like that. He gave everyone the will to choose their own path. He would have waited for you to turn back to him. He's a patient God, he wouldn't kill someone to pay for someone else's sin. It's not your fault at all. When that did nothing to stop her tears, Sylvie added, you'll feel better when you've had some sleep. Sylvie was looking forward to some sleep as well. She was so tired she could hardly keep her eyes open, and she knew that there were only a few hours before daybreak. Sabrina, I have to go to work at eleven in the morning. Do you want me to take the day off to stay with you? Nay, I'll be all right. You go. I'll be better tomorrow. You're right, I probably just need a good sleep. When her head hit the pillow less than half an hour later, Sylvie was filled with worry. What was she going to do with Sabrina? Sabrina should go to the bishop and confess her sin, but Sabrina was old enough to make that decision on her own. Maybe the bishop might have her confess to the whole congregation and tell them what she had done. Sylvie's cheeks flushed as she considered the embarrassment and humiliation Sabrina would feel if that were the case. News travels quickly amongst the Amish, and her mother and father would surely get to learn of it if the whole congregation heard her confession. Sylvie told God all her worries and handed them all over to him, so she could have at least a little sleep. Chapter 3 Let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness, and let him reprove me, it shall be an excellent oil which shall not break my head, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. Psalm chapter 141 verse 5 Sylvie peeked into Sabrina's room before she left for work the next morning. A china cup on Sabrina's nightstand told Sylvie that Sabrina had woken and fixed herself some tea. If only she didn't need the money her job at the bakery gave her, then she would have been able to stay home and be there when Sabrina woke up. But she did need the money, and things had been much harder on Sylvie now she had to keep Sabrina as well as herself. Sabrina would not have realized the financial burden that she had put on Sylvie. Sabrina had never worked a day in her life, and being the youngest, she had never had to do as many chores as the older ones had. Sylvie wondered whether it was her easy lifestyle and lack of responsibility, which caused Sabrina to make bad choices. Maybe she should have Sabrina pay room and board to force her to take a job, and give her a sense of responsibility. When Sylvie arrived to start work at the bakery cafe, the whole place was abuzz with the talk of the local murder. Sylvie naturally kept quiet about what she knew, and the fact that her sister had been the one to find the body. Throughout the day, Sylvie kept her ears open. The rumors were that Carmelo had been poisoned, and his wife was distraught. She also heard talk that Carmelo Leonte was a ladies' man, a charmer, some went so far as to call him a womanizer. It was suggested that Carmelo always had a mistress on the side, and the loving wife Stephanie Leonte had no idea. Sylvie decided it best to keep that information from Sabrina, at least for the moment. There was no point in upsetting her further, especially as it might have been nothing more than idle gossip. Sylvie learned that Carmelo co-owned an accountancy firm with a business partner, Neville Banks. After her workday, Sylvie arrived home in the afternoon. She hoped that Sabrina might be busying herself with gardening or housework, but instead Sabrina was nowhere to be seen. Sylvie peeked in Sabrina's bedroom to see that she was still in bed, fast asleep. Resentment rose in Sylvie. She'd had hardly any sleep and had to force herself out of bed to go to work so she could make ends meet. Sabrina was still asleep and had done nothing to help with the running of the household. Not only had she done nothing to help, she had added an extra burden onto Sylvie with the worry of the murder and the worry of Sabrina's indiscretion. Sylvie glanced at the clock. It was nearly time to prepare dinner and with Sabrina still asleep she would have to do that chore by herself. Sylvie picked up her Bible and sat in the couch. What lesson are you trying to teach me God? she asked aloud. She knew in her heart before she asked that he was trying to show her how to have more compassion and be less judgmental. Her Bible opened automatically to Matthew chapter 7. She read the first few verses. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? 
She smiled and knew that she could not judge her sister for what she had done. Anyone could fall into temptation if they were not mindful. As it was nearing dinner time, Sylvie forced herself into the kitchen, pulled some vegetables out of the container in the icebox and began to cut them into pieces. A loud knock on the door made her jump a little with fright. She opened the door and in front of her stood a small, dark-haired woman. Her hair was swept up on her head and she wore a cream jacket and skirt and high heels. Hello. Can I help you? Sylvie asked. My name is Stephanie Leonte, I'm Carmelo's wife, is all that the woman said as she looked Sylvie up and down. Sylvie's jaw dropped open and she was lost for words. The rumors said that this woman knew nothing of Carmelo's indiscretions, so what was she doing standing there? Sylvie realized that the woman might have thought she was the one having the affair with Carmelo. Sabrina and Sylvie looked very much alike except that Sylvie was older. Should she say that she wasn't Sabrina? Sylvie licked her lips. I was sorry to hear about your husband. Mrs. Leonte scoffed. I don't think much of your religion if you think you can whore around town with other people's husbands. You're looking for me. Sylvie nearly jumped with fright when she heard Sabrina's voice coming from behind her. Sylvie stepped to one side, blocking Sabrina from the woman. I'm sorry about your husband but I don't know what we can do for you, Sylvie said, not wanting the two women to come face to face. I just wanted to look at the woman who thought she could get away with having an affair with my husband. The police told me that she was the one who found him. How do I know that she wasn't the last person to see him alive? Are you saying I killed him? Sabrina asked, trying to talk to the woman from behind Sylvie. When did you last see him? Alive, I mean? Sylvie asked Mrs. Leonte. Not that it's any of your business, but I saw him at home before he left for work in the morning after we made passionate love. That's not true, Sabrina spat out her words with the viciousness of a wild cat. Sylvie turned her head slightly to speak to Sabrina. Hush. She turned back to Mrs. Leonte. You didn't see him later in the day? No, I did not. It's none of your business anyway. Sabrina successfully pushed Sylvie out of the way and was now facing the furious woman. You weren't sleeping with him. He told me you were separated. Anyway, what makes you so angry with me? How dare you? We were not separated, we were happy. I was happy until I found out about you just today. The police told me all about you. They said you were having an affair with him, and you were the one who found him dead. You probably killed him, you little strumpet. It was when Sylvie tried to pull Sabrina back into the house she realized she still had the vegetable chopping knife in one hand. While holding the knife in one hand and struggling with Sabrina in the other, Sylvie said, I'm sorry but I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Are you threatening me with that knife? Mrs. Leonte asked. Sylvie glanced at the knife, which was now in the air, and immediately lowered her hand. No, I was just chopping vegetables. The woman backed away. How did you get our address? The police wouldn't have given it to you, Sylvie said. I've got resources, don't you worry about that. I'll see you both get what's coming to you. You religious freaks. The woman turned and took two steps toward her car then turned around. No, I take that back, you are whores and tarts. I'll have you run out of town. The woman stomped back to her car, slammed the door and drove away. Sylvie pulled Sabrina back inside and closed the door with a heavy heart. What Sabrina had done was a sad reflection on all the Amish. What a horrible woman, Sabrina said. After she locked the door, Sylvie said, Sabrina, her husband has just died, and she's also just found out that he was having an affair with you. How do you think that she'd feel? Sabrina shrugged her shoulders. They were separated. Whether they were or they weren't, the woman has lost a husband. Sabrina frowned. So you're on her side. I've lost the man I loved, why aren't you on my side? I don't have a side. There are no sides. Nothing is ever black or white. Just try and see someone else's side for once. So you are on her side? I think I might go back to Mam and Dad, at least they like me. Sabrina burst into tears and ran into her room, slamming the door behind her. Sylvie returned to the kitchen to finish cutting the last of the vegetables. 
There was no use speaking to someone who was hysterical. Two minutes later, there was another knock on the door. This time, Sylvie was careful to put the knife down before she answered the door. Stay in your bedroom, Sabrina. I'll handle it. Sylvie was sure it was Carmelo's wife back again. Sylvie opened the door to see the two police they had spoken to in the early hours of the morning. I'll come in. Sorry to disturb you. We've got some questions for Sabrina. Certainly come in. She knocked on Sabrina's bedroom door. It's the police. Sylvie showed the police to the living room, and Sabrina joined them moments later. You said in your statement that you saw Mrs. Leonte come to Mr. Leonte's office? That's correct. I've already told you everything I know. I saw him dead, I hid in the next office because I wasn't supposed to be there. I only hid because I heard someone walking in the hallway, and then they called out his name. I heard someone come in the room and leave almost right away. I heard the downstairs door shut, and I looked out the window and saw Mrs. Leonte cross the road. No one else was around, it had to be she who was in the office. The two policemen looked at each other. Why do you look at each other like that? Sylvie asked. Mrs. Leonte claims that she was at home at the time. Her housekeeper testifies that she was there with her all day. She's fibbing, of course, Sabrina said. She was just here threatening to run us out of town. The older of the two policemen said, Do you want to file a complaint against her? Yes, Sabrina said. No, Sylvie shouted over the top of her sister. She glared at Sabrina as she continued, No, we do not want to file a complaint. The woman was just upset. Very well. If you change your mind, let us know. The policeman stood up. Sylvie and Sabrina followed sweet. Did you find the cause of death yet? Sylvie asked. It looks like he was poisoned. Sabrina doubled over and held her stomach. Sylvie sat her back down on the couch and walked the policeman to the door. What type of poison was it? We're not certain yet, we have to wait for the lab reports. It could be something else, but the initial examination suggested poison. That's all I know at this stage. Sylvie lowered her voice so Sabrina would not overhear. So do you think that it was murder? Or could he have somehow accidentally taken the poison? Murder, one of the policemen said, while the other nodded in agreement. You came here just to find out if Sabrina had made a mistake about seeing Mrs. Leonte there? That's correct. Seems one of them must be giving us false information. Mrs. Leonte has an alibi and your sister has none. Maybe she should rethink her statement. Is Sabrina a suspect? Sylvie asked. The policeman who had done most of the talking said, not at the moment, unless we find evidence to suggest otherwise. Is Detective Crowley handling this case? Yes, he is. He's in charge of the investigation. All right. Thank you. As Sylvie shut the door, she was thankful that Crowley was in charge of the investigation. Detective Crowley had helped her and her group of widow friends in the past. Chapter 4 Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Colossians chapter 3 verse 12 The next night was the night of the widows' meeting. The five widows regularly met at the elderly sisters, Elsa May and Eddie's, house for friendship and to discuss whatever was on their minds. Sylvie brought Sabrina because Sabrina did not want to be left alone. Emma was the first to speak to Sabrina. I'm sorry to hear what happened, Sabrina. Danka, Emma. Sabrina shot a quizzical look to Sylvie. All the ladies here know about what happened. We don't have any secrets and we can all help you, Sylvie said. What way can they help me? Sabrina asked. Elsa May leaned forward. This thing's not over yet, not by a long shot. You saw Mrs. Leonte cross the street after she saw her husband dead in his office. She had no reaction, neither did she call the police. She denies to the police she was ever there and had her housekeeper say that she was at home. Something stinks. I suppose it does, Sabrina said. But there's nothing much I can do. There are things that we can do, though, 
Eddie said as she waved one of her long bony fingers in the air. Maureen leaned her ample body toward Sabrina. Don't you worry about a thing, we'll find out who killed him. He'll still be dead though, so what's the point? Sabrina wriggled in her chair. How do you people sit in these chairs? Don't you have anything more comfortable? Sabrina looked at Elsa May and Eddie. Why don't you have a couch like everyone else does? Sylvie lowered her head in embarrassment at her Schweshiter's constant ungratefulness and complaining. What's wrong with the chairs? Elsa May asked. Sylvie was embarrassed at Sabrina's words. The elderly sisters had no couch, just several wooden chairs. No one had ever said anything to them about the discomfort up until now. Sabrina scrunched up her face. They're hard and they're worse than what we have to sit on at the gatherings. Sylvie shot her head up. Be quiet about the chairs. Everyone is trying to help you. Sabrina lifted her chin to the ceiling. I'm not in any trouble. Yeah, but you might be if they start thinking you had anything to do with his murder, Emma said. You wouldn't be the first innocent person to end up in jail. I'm not going to jail. Sabrina looked at Sylvie. I wish you hadn't made me come here. You said that you didn't want to be left alone, Sylvie said. I didn't know it was going to be like this. You said you sat around and talked and ate cakes and things. Sabrina swiveled her head around. Where are the cakes? Sylvie looked at the other widows and said, I'm sorry. This is not something to be taken lightly, Sabrina. A man's been murdered, and they are looking for someone to pin it on. I mean, they'll be looking for the person who did it. Elsa May's voice boomed so loud that Sabrina cringed. Elsa May continued, Sabrina, you must tell us everything you know and don't leave anything out. Sabrina straightened her back. What kind of things? Start with telling us if you know of anyone, anyone at all who would wish Carmelo harm, Elsa May said. His wife for one. He wanted a divorce, and she didn't give him one, until he agreed that she could have everything. She was about to sign the papers that day. I'm not sure if she did or not. Elsa May pushed her finger into her round cheek. Seems silly for her to kill him, if she was going to get everything anyway. Anyone else? He often fought with Neville, his business partner. What about? Eddie asked. Just business things, I guess. Then he had a secretary that he had to fire. She was lazy and never did anything she was told, and turned up late to work and left early. When he fired her, she put in a claim of sexual harassment, but then she dropped it a few weeks later. What was her name? Elsa May asked. I can't remember. Maybe I never heard it, I couldn't really say. Do you think that's important? Elsa May ignored her question. Have you met any of these people? Nay, yeah, I've just seen them. I haven't actually met them. Except Sylvie and I met the wife yesterday. She came to the door and was really mean. What did she say? Emma asked. She called us both horrible names and said she'd have us run out of town, Sylvie said. No wonder Carmelo wanted a divorce from her, Sabrina said. People can't say awful things when they're upset, Maureen said. She would have had a nasty shock over the whole thing. Elsa may read back her notes that she'd scribbled on her yellow writing pad. Suspects so far are the wife, the secretary, or I should say the ex-secretary and the business partner Neville. That's the only people I know about, Sabrina said. Eddie, you do what you do best, which is scout around and talk to people. Find out what you can about Carmelo. Emma, you go and speak to Crowley and see what he knows so far. Me. Why do I always have to speak to Crowley? He'll ask me why I'm not married to Will yet. Do you know that last time he called me Mrs. Jacobson, when he knows very well my last name is Kurtzler? He takes delight in making me uneasy. Nonsense, Emma. You were the one to speak with him most of the time on the last case, and he told you everything he knew. Yeah, Emma. Just put your personal feelings to one side, Eddie said. What do you mean last case? Are you all like detectives or something? Sabrina asked as she looked around at each of the widows. Nay, we just help people where we can, that's all, Maureen said with a wide smile revealing the slight gap between her two front teeth. Emma blew out a deep breath. 
Okay, I'll go and talk to him first thing in the morning. Good, Elsa May said then turned to Maureen. Maureen, you try and find out what you can about the housekeeper. How will I do that? I don't know where they live or what the housekeeper's name is or anything, Maureen said. Emma will find all those sorts of things from Crowley and then you can take things from there, Elsa May said. What do you want me to do? Sylvie asked. You just look after Sabrina. Sabrina smiled and her face lighted up until Elsa May added, keep her out of any more trouble because she obviously does not have one ounce of common sense. Sabrina's smile vanished, replaced with an angry glower directed at the elderly Elsa May. Elsa May glared right back at her until Sabrina looked away. You were after some cake, weren't you, Sabrina? Eddie said as she rose to her feet. The smile quickly returned to Sabrina's face. Yeah, Sylvie said that there would be cake. Coming right up, Eddie said. Chapter 5 Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 The next morning, Emma reluctantly knocked on Detective Crowley's office door. She knew how uncomfortable he would make her feel, but the widows needed his help and he had always come through for them. Come in. His deep voice rang in Emma's ears as she stepped through his doorway. Detective Crowley stood up from behind his desk. Ah, Mrs. Kurtzler. Elsa May told me you'd be coming this morning. Call me Emma. He waved his hand in the direction of one of the two chairs in front of his desk. Have a seat. Emma sat down and licked her lips as nerves had made her mouth dry. Thankfully the detective spoke first on the subject she'd come about. You're interested to know about Carmelo Leonte? Yes, I am. Sabrina, Sylvie's sister, found him dead before the janitor found him, but she was scared and hid when she heard someone coming. I know, I've read her statement. Says she heard Mrs. Leonte come into the office, look at her dead husband on the floor then leave. That's right. Emma crossed her legs in an effort to feel more comfortable, but she nearly tipped herself off balance on the chair. She uncrossed her legs and hoped Crowley hadn't noticed her awkwardness. His raised eyebrow and downturned mouth told Emma that he had noticed. Then the detective lowered his eyebrow, and his face returned to its usual deadpan state. Did it occur to you that this might be a crime of passion, and Sabrina might be guilty in trying to implicate Mrs. Leonte? Emma sat tall, she was highly offended by his suggestion. No, it didn't occur to me because I know that is not true. Amish aren't capable of violence. It's against everything we stand for. Detective Crowley picked up a pencil and tapped it a couple of times on his desk. Isn't having relations with a married man also against what the Amish believe in? He's trying to rattle you again, Emma. Think your answer through before you speak. Emma knew what he said was true, and she did not like having to defend Sabrina's actions. All people sin, detective, even the Amish, because we are still people. To answer your question, I do not believe that Sabrina is capable of murder. She was in love with the man, and she had no reason to kill him. He pushed out his lips. He might have told her that he didn't want to see her anymore. Emma narrowed her eyes. But he didn't. You can't know that with absolute certainty. I know it in my heart. Emma pounded her fist against her heart so hard that she involuntarily coughed. I agree. The detective leaned back in his chair. You do? Yes. I don't think she did it at all. He swiveled slightly in his chair and then stopped. Why did you say those things, detective? The detective gave one of his seldom-seen smiles. To see how strongly you agreed with me. Emma tilted her head at the riddles the detective was speaking in. Why can't he just speak straightly? Emma thought. You were testing me, she asked. The detective leaned back in his chair once more, but he remained silent. Emma wished that Elsa May had come instead of her. She knew that the detective would cause her to feel foolish. Emma forged ahead with the reason she was there. Now that we have all that out of the way, what can you tell me about the case? Seems that Carmela was quite the ladies' man. Emma was disappointed to hear that, 
and hoped it wasn't true. Sabrina would be sad to know that she hadn't been the only woman in his life. Is it true that his wife was just about to sign some sort of contract, like divorce papers or some kind of property settlement papers? We found no personal papers whatsoever in his office. I personally questioned Mrs. Leonte, and she told me that she had a happy marriage and was unaware of any indiscretions. When she learned of your friend Sabrina's relationship with her husband, she was visibly shaken. She either had no idea her husband was having an affair, or she's a mighty good actress. She denies any talk of separation or divorce. Emma knew that the woman was not being truthful, but that did not mean that she was guilty of murder. Did she know of anyone who wished her husband harm? She said that she couldn't think of a single enemy her husband might have had. Was he poisoned? He'd ingested a lethal dose of aconitine. What is aconitine? It's derived from a highly toxic plant, the monkshood plant, also known as wolf's bane. It's nature's poison. A person can be poisoned just from picking the leaves without wearing gloves. It's lethal. Emma chewed on a fingernail at the thought of the painful death Carmelo might have had. Poison would not be the nicest way to die. Could it have been an accident? Not in that dose. Suicide. There was no note and no poison near him. Suicide isn't plausible. Elsa May also wanted me to ask you about Mrs. Leonte's address and the name of the housekeeper. Detective Crowley shook his head. Elsa May said if you don't want to give it that's okay, there are plenty of other ways she can find out. The detective continued to shake his head as he wrote the information on a slip of paper and handed it to Emma. Emma smiled. Thank you, Detective Crowley. The detective leaned forward and spoke in a low tone. You didn't get that information from me. He gave Emma a wink. Chapter 6 What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. James chapter 2 verses 14 to 17. At the widow's meeting the next night, Detective Crowley told all the widows how Carmelo Leonte had died. Elsa May smiled. Ah yes, aconitine. It's a slow and painful death resulting in paralysis just before death. It's actually a pretty plant with blue-violet flowers, but extremely poisonous. It's native to Northern Europe. How would anyone get it around these parts? Sylvie asked. Elsa May tapped on her chin with her fingertips. That's the origin of the plant, it's grown all over the place now. The roots and leaves can be dried just like any other herb. Interesting, Eddie said in a bored tone which sounded deliberate. Elsa May continued, it is said that's how the Roman Emperor Claudius died from the same poison. It was rumored that his wife poisoned him. Funny that Leonte was Italian too, and his wife is a suspect. Claudius who? Sylvie asked. Never mind, you wouldn't know him, Elsa May said. I'm not about to try and explain the whole of the ancient Roman civilization to people who probably don't even know where Italy is. Eddie groaned. Don't be boastful of all your library reading, Elsa May. Dad always told you not to be prideful. He thought that might happen when you spent so much time reading. Elsa May glared at Eddie. I was married at the time with two children. Dad had nothing to do with it, and Liam was happy for me to go. HMMPH. Eddie shrugged. Liam would have let you fly to the moon if you asked him. You spent a lot of time in the library all those years ago. Sylvie asked. Elsa May smiled. I did, and I'm not prideful about it. I craved learning about all kinds of things and still do. That's all very interesting, I'm sure but you ladies can discuss those things when I'm not here. Let's get back to the point, shall we? I found out that Mr. Leonte was worth around four million dollars, possibly more, Detective Crowley said. The widows gasped. Sylvie turned to Sabrina. Did you know of this? Nay, what does it matter how much he had? Sabrina said. 
The detective's eyes fixed firmly onto Sabrina as he asked, Did you know that you, Sabrina, have been left one quarter of everything? Really? Well, that's one thing he didn't tell me. Who was left the rest? Sabrina. Sylvie said shocked at her Schweshitter's rudeness. Eddie interrupted before the detective could answer Sabrina's question. Sabrina won't have to go to the reading of the will and be in the same room as Mrs. Leonte, will she? No. I was getting to that. Mrs. Leonte is in the hospital. It seems that there was an attempt on her life this afternoon. Someone broke into her home with a knife. The housekeeper disturbed the intruder and he fled. The widows murmured their shock. That's awful, Eddie said. Is she hurt badly? Sylvie asked. She has small cuts and she's suffering from severe shock. She's under sedation now. I've got a guard stationed on her door, just in case the attacker thinks he'll be able to get to her in there. I've another piece of news. Mr. Leonte's business partner has disappeared. You're full of surprises tonight, detective. Is there anything else we need to know? Elsa May said. The detective shook his head. I wouldn't mind a chocolate slice or a cookie. The detective looked around the room. Are you ladies on diets? There's usually food galore here. Eddie rose to her feet. I'll get it. We've started talking first before we eat. We seem to get more done that way. Your usual black tea, detective? Yes, please. What will you do with all that money, Sabrina? Maureen asked. I'll stay here in Lancaster County and buy a house. I'll give some to Sylvie and some to Mam and Dad. Sylvie said, You don't need to give any to me, Sabrina, but it's a kindly thought. I want to give you some money, so you don't have to work so hard. I don't work that hard, and I enjoy the bakery, Sylvie said, pleased that her sister had a generous heart. Okay, I'll keep it all then, Sabrina said without the hint of a smile. When do I get the money, detective? I've never been left any money before. You'd have to wait a time until probate goes through. Could be weeks or months. There's no telling how long it will be. How much did Mrs. Leonte get? Sabrina asked. The remainder of his estate was divided amongst Miss Scottsdale, Miss Tobrell, and Mrs. Leonte. I should let you know that Mr. Leonte's lawyer suggested that Mrs. Leonte could contest the will and she'd likely have a good case. Who are those other two women? Sabrina asked. As far as I've been able to ascertain, one was a girlfriend of some time ago before you came along, that was Miss Tobrell. Miss Scottsdale was his former secretary. What does it mean to contest the will, detective? Sylvie asked. She could take the matter to court and claim that the will was unfair to her since she was the lawful wife. The courts might decide that it's only she who is entitled to his entire estate. If she does take it to court, it's hard to say which way it will go. Sabrina bounded to her feet and walked outside. Maureen stood up to follow but Sylvie said, leave her Maureen. She needs to be by herself for a while. Maureen sat down. It must be an awful shock to her. She brought it all on herself, thinking she could get away with such a terrible thing as having an affair with a married man. The widows remained silent, and Sylvie reprimanded herself for her judgmental attitude, knowing that it wasn't her place to judge anyone. Eddie came out of the kitchen with a tray of goodies. There you are, detective, Emma's chocolate fudge, chocolate chip cookies and a chocolate cake that I baked today. And my poor old sugar cookies, Maureen said. Everything can't be chocolate, Emma said. The detective took a chocolate slice and said, You ladies sure know how to cook. Sylvie, are you sure Sabrina's all right? Should someone go and check on her? Emma asked. Nay, the fresh night air will do her some good and she'll come back in when she's ready, Sylvie said. Who are the suspects, detective? Elsa May asked. I think we can safely rule Mrs. Leonte out. She would not have known that she wasn't left all of the money, so she would have had no motive. Now it would appear that she's in danger too. Perhaps we need to be looking for someone who had a grudge against both of them. Who does that leave? Elsa May asked with pen and paper in hand. The business partner has to be the main suspect now that he's disappeared, the detective replied. Detective, what do you know about these other women? 
Could one of them be a jilted lover out for revenge? That's the next possibility. There's also the possibility that Mr. Leontay told Miss Tobrel or Miss Scottsdale of their inheritance, and they wanted to speed things along or have him die before he changed his will again. Eddie shook her head. Terrible, terrible mess. It's unusual for an Amish woman to get involved with a man like that, isn't it? The detective looked at Sylvie. I mean, I know it is, but what prompted her to do such a thing? She would say love, Sylvie said. The detective scoffed. Seems Mr. Leontay had plenty of that to go around. Do you think that Mrs. Leontay knew of these other women? Maureen asked. Detective Crowley thought for a moment before he said, Going on my talks with her, it seemed she was totally unaware, although she did comment that her husband worked hard and was away a lot. Generally that would be cause for suspicion, or at least put some doubt in a woman's mind, but not Mrs. Leontay. Sabrina walked back in and sat down on the hard wooden chair. Detective, do you think I'll get any money at all if Mrs. Leontay contests? The widows raised their eyebrows at her comment. It hardly seemed the main concern since the man was dead, no one knew who murdered him and she'd been caught out in sin. It's hard to say. It's unlikely that she won't contest the will. It depends what the courts decide. They'll take into account that he was of sane mind when he wrote the will and that was his choice. You'll just have to wait and see what happens. Sylvie leaned toward her sister. That's hardly the most important issue here, Sabrina. Sabrina looked at Sylvie and remained silent. After he ate two more chocolate fudge squares and drank half his tea, the detective got to his feet. I'm off to talk to Mrs. Leonte at the hospital. I'll see if she's able to speak yet, see what else I can find out. I was going to wait till tomorrow, but I'll see if she's up to talking tonight. The detective chuckled. That'll be one less thing I have to do tomorrow. As soon as he left, Elsa May said, Mrs. Leonte was my main suspect. What do you know about the business partner, Sabrina? Let me think. Sabrina pressed a finger into her cheek. I never met him. He was good at business, and I know that Carmela was happy with him most of the time, apart from some arguments. What is his name? Eddie asked. Neville Banks. Was he aware that Carmelo was having relationships with women outside his marriage? Elsa May asked Sabrina. As far as I knew he wasn't. I thought it was only me, and he told me that he was separated and living in a different room in the house, Sabrina said. I had no reason to disbelieve him, especially when I saw with my own eyes how they interacted with one another. The first day I met him, was after they had a big argument in a coffee shop. She knocked me over when she stormed out and he apologized to me. Ah, that's an important thing to tell the detective since she claims that they were happily married. Just a moment. Elsa May drew her cell phone out of the top drawer of the dresser in the living room. Sabrina gasped. You have a cell, Elsa May. Only for emergencies. Elsa May looked at Emma. I know, I know, I'll use it outside. Elsa May stepped through the front door. No one can judge me for what I've done if Elsa May has a cell phone. We're not supposed to have things like that, Sabrina said. What you've done is much worse, Sylvie snapped before she could stop herself. No one's judging you. It's God who judges, Maureen said. Sabrina looked down at the floor. He's going to talk to Mrs. Leonte in the hospital tonight. Tomorrow afternoon he'll make a surprise visit to Mrs. Leontay's house, question the housekeeper and have her show him through the house. Won't he need a warrant? Emma asked. Nay, only if the housekeeper objects, but why would she if there's nothing to hide? Elsa May sat back down. We should meet back here same time tomorrow, directly after dinner. Why doesn't everyone come to my house for dinner? Emma asked. Everyone agreed, but then Elsa May said, Nay, I told Crowley to come back here same time tomorrow night. Some other time, Emma. Emma nodded. Eddie said to Elsa May, why don't we summarize all that we've learned? Elsa May looked down at her list. Carmelo was poisoned, his business partner Neville Banks is missing. Someone tried to kill Mrs. Leontay at her home with a knife, and now she's in the hospital. Carmelo left money to his wife, and money to three other women, 
and it's quite likely that Mrs. Leonte doesn't know of it yet and is expecting to inherit everything. Have I left anything out? Eddie looked at all the widows. Nay, I think that's it. Well, we'll meet here with Crowley tomorrow and see what else he's found out. Now we'll have to find out things as well, or Crowley will stop being so free with giving us information. Sylvie, you see if you can find out which lawyer is handling the will. It could be your lawyer friend, the one who comes to the bakery all the time. Sylvie said George Winters. I'll see what I can do. Emma leaned over to Maureen and said quietly, I've got the house address of the Mrs. Leonte and the housekeeper's name. Crowley gave it to me. Danka, Maureen said. Elsa May overheard what Emma said. Yeah, Maureen. You see what you can find out. Maureen nodded. I'll snoop around the house, talk to the housekeeper, and see what I can find out. She'll most likely talk to me rather than the police. I'll pretend I'm there about a job. Chapter 7 Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Romans chapter 5 verse 18 An hour later, Sylvie was glad to be home. As Sylvie and Sabrina walked through the front door, Sabrina said, I suppose you think that I should confess to the bishop what I've done. Sylvie sank into the couch. I'm tired, Sabrina, I don't want an argument. Sabrina sat next to her. I just asked a simple question. I know, but your tone is argumentative, and I can't deal with it tonight. It's too late, and I've got to get up at five tomorrow morning and go to work. Sylvie glanced at her china clock. That's just five hours I'll have of sleep if I'm blessed to have that much. I don't want to go and see the bishop. Sylvie winced at Sabrina's high-pitched tone and covered her ears. She'd had enough of her sister, enough of her problems and enough of her constant whining. She wondered if Carmelo had ever seen this side of her. It's up to you, but I'm certain that he'll be knocking on our door soon to ask why you haven't been to the gatherings. It'll either be him or one of the ministers. They might even write a letter to your bishop in Ohio. Sabrina sighed. I'll think about going to see him then. Sylvie still did not understand how her sister could do what she had done. Things were worse if Carmelo had been lying to her about being separated from his wife. If you want to stay in the community, you'll need to speak to the bishop. You may be shunned for a time, Sylvie said. Shunned a nay. Yeah, shunned. Maybe you'll have to confess what you've done at the gathering. You'll have to stand and ask forgiveness. Maybe you'll be shunned, and then have to ask forgiveness before you come back. Sabrina was quiet then tilted her head upwards as she said, I won't be shunned because I haven't been baptized yet. Sylvie tilted her head to the side. I thought you had been baptized. Sabrina shook her head. Have you thought about your prospects of attracting a man after all this has happened? It won't help you find a man once they hear of this. Your name will be associated with what you've done. Sylvie knew her words were harsh. She didn't want to hurt Sabrina, she just wanted her to come to terms with the reality of what she'd done. Sabrina stood up. I was in love with Carmelo. Don't you understand that? I'll never be able to love another man. So what does it matter? Tears poured down Sabrina's face as she ran to her room sobbing uncontrollably. Sylvie sat by herself. She was giving her opinion, and it was true. Sabrina would find it difficult to find a husband now with the scandal in her past. She was trying to prepare her for what was to come. Sylvie knew that there was no use speaking to Sabrina when she was tired and crying. She would speak to her tomorrow, but tonight Sylvie needed to get as much sleep as she could before her 5 a.m. start. Sylvie took off her prayer cap and took the pins out of her hair. Her long dark blonde hair fell down her back. She climbed the stairs to her bedroom, hoping that the next few weeks would not be too horrible for Sabrina. At least Sabrina wasn't a suspect in Carmela's murder, that was one thing that they could be thankful for. Moments later Sylvie heard a voice in the darkness. Are you asleep, Sylvie? Nay, not yet. Come in. Sabrina pushed Sylvie's door open. I will go to the bishop. I'll give myself a day or two to think about what I'll say. I'll take whatever punishment I have to take. 
I don't want to leave the community. I thought about it, and I don't want to be an Englisher. I want to remain here in Lancaster County with you. While propping herself up with pillows, Sylvie said, That's good, Sabrina. I'm glad you've made that choice. Sylvie would prefer Sabrina to go back home, but she was her sister. She had to look after her, and if she wanted to stay, Sylvie would have to do what she could to make her stay a happy one. Sabrina sat on the edge of Sylvie's bed. I'll get a job because I don't know if I'll get any of Carmelo's money or not. I'll get a job to help out with money and I'll do more chores around the house. Sylvie smiled, her sister was finally taking responsibility for her life. I'm happy about that. Do you think I should go to Carmelo's funeral? Sylvie shook her head violently at the thought of Sabrina showing up at Carmelo's funeral. Nay, I'd stay away if I were you. Yeah, I think it'd be best for me to stay away but it's hard. I loved him so much, I feel as though I should be the person arranging the funeral. I feel as though I was his wife. That's the way things work, Sabrina. Officially, you weren't his wife, and now you have to guard your reputation from any more talk or any more trouble. It won't do anyone any good for you to go to the funeral. It'll create a scene or a lot of chatter at the very least. Sabrina lowered her head. Do you think that I'll ever get over Carmelo's death? After some time, yeah. It must have been hard for you when John died. Sylvie had never shared with Sabrina the fact that she had not been in love with John when she married, and neither was she about to share it with her at this point in time. It was very hard, but I adjusted. In life you have to learn to adapt to change, the good and the bad. Life is constantly changing and most of it is out of our control. Danka for helping me through this, Sylvie. Sabrina leaned over and hugged her sister. Once she straightened up she asked, Can you come to the bishop with me? Nay, I can't. It's best you go alone. That kind of thing has to be done by yourself. Please come with me, Sylvie. I can't do that on my own. I really want you to come with me. Nay. I'll drive with you and wait outside but I can't come in with you. Sabrina bounded to her feet. What do I ever ask you to do? I ask you one little thing and you say no. I will never ask you anything ever again. Sabrina stomped out of the room and shut Sylvie's door firmly on her way out. Sylvie sighed and sank back into her pillow. For a moment she thought that Sabrina had changed, but she was being nice so she would accompany her to the bishop. Sylvie closed her eyes and hoped that sleep wouldn't be far away. Chapter 8 When I was a child I spake as a child, I understood as a child I thought as a child, but when I became a man I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abide it faith, hope, charity these three. But the greatest of these is charity. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 11 to 13 At the bakery the next day, Sylvie waited for Mr. Winters of Winters and Sons lawyers to come in for coffee. He came in every day for at least one coffee, and today Sylvie would question him about the Leontes and hoped that he knew them. Maybe he was their lawyer. It was after the lunch hour rush that Mr. Winters came into the bakery. Thankfully he was alone, so Sylvie seized the opportunity of her fifteen-minute break to have a chat with him. Sit with me, Sylvie. He always asked Sylvie to sit and talk with him, and this time she was in a position where she was able. Sylvie pulled out the chair on the other side of the small round table. I can today, I've just begun my break. Mr. Winters, have you heard of the death of Mr. Leonte? He owned an accountancy firm just up the road here. Mr. Winters finished the mouthful of the salad roll he had just bitten off. Heard of him. I'm going to tell you something that's normally highly confidential, but under the circumstances you need to know. Carmelo Leonte came to me last week wanting a will drawn up fast. He was a new client. He came to me because his lawyer was too slow, and he wanted a new will drawn up quickly. Sylvie couldn't help the gasp that escaped from her lips. That's right. He told me that a couple of months ago, he had another will drawn up, and he said it had taken his lawyer three weeks to prepare it. I told him if it was simple, then I could do it for him in a matter of hours. 
What reason are you telling me this? What circumstances do you mean, and did you end up doing the new will? Sylvie wondered whether Crowley knew about this recent will, or had he only been in contact with the lawyer who had the will from months ago? Yes, I drew the will up as Carmelo Leonte requested. It wasn't a complicated one. There was only one beneficiary. Are you sure it was the same Mr. Leonte who was just murdered who came to see you? As soon as she asked the question Sylvie realized how silly it was. How many Carmelo Leontes could there be in the world? He looked at Sylvie from under silver bushy brows. Sylvie I deal in facts of course I'm sure. Do the police know that? Detective Crowley spoke of a will, but said nothing of it being drawn up the day before. Sylvie scratched her neck. You haven't told me yet why you're telling me all this. You can't sit with me and not eat anything, Mr. Winters said. I've got Teresa bringing me a cheese and lettuce roll. Mr. Winters nodded. That's good. You have to keep up with feeding yourself, there's nothing of you. Sylvie smiled at his concern. We were speaking of the will. Ah, the will. The will was drawn up but never signed. Sylvie tilted her head to one side and opened her mouth to speak, but stopped when her co-worker Teresa placed her food in front of her. Thank you, Teresa. Don't hurry from your break, Sylvie. We're not that busy, Teresa said. Thanks, Teresa. Sylvie glanced around the tables in the bakery. Teresa was right, they weren't that busy. So, you say that the will was never signed? I saw him the day he died, and he told me who the beneficiary was to be. He couldn't wait while I drew it up and fiddled around with the form on my computer. He said he had a busy day and asked me if I could stay late and meet him after five so he could sign it. I waited for him but he never showed. I figured he forgot the appointment. I left a note for my secretary to phone him the next day to reschedule. Can you tell me who the beneficiary was? Ah, that's what I was getting to. The reason I'm telling you all this is that your sister was the sole beneficiary. Sylvie's hand flew to her open mouth as it fell open in disbelief. Mr. Winters continued, I was shocked that he was leaving his estate to a woman who wasn't his wife. Someone I haven't even heard about. He leaned in close to her. I usually hear of everything in this town. He explained the situation and said he was in love with Sybil, was it? Sabrina, Sylvie corrected him. Anyway, as I said, we had a chat and he told me she was Amish, and I saw that she had the same last name as the one on your badge. He pointed to Sylvie's name badge. Sylvie looked down at her badge and her fingers were drawn to touch it. Since John died, Sylvie sometimes went by her maiden name of Tildy. So he did love her. I'd say most definitely. He told Sabrina that he wanted to leave his wife, and she wouldn't give him a divorce until he agreed to give her everything. He wouldn't have had anything to leave Sabrina, would he, if he got divorced? He was a wealthy man and had millions in non-marital assets. His wife would only have been entitled to what is termed marital assets. Marital assets are those which are attained by either party during the term of the marriage. It was the marital assets that they were at loggerheads over. I'm a personal friend of the lawyer who was handling his divorce, so I did hear snippets. Mind you, I don't know the finer details of the divorce proceedings or the property settlement. The more Sylvie listened, the more it seemed that Carmelo might have been genuinely in love with Sabrina. He did tell Sabrina that he and his wife were separated, but still living in the same house. Do you know anything about that? Sylvie took a bite of her roll. Mr. Winters leaned back and dabbed at the corners of his mouth with a white napkin. If one party doesn't consent to the divorce, the only way to get a divorce in this state is to be separated for two years and then the divorce goes through without a hitch. There are little things she could try and do to stop it but usually when two years has passed it's just some more paperwork and then a divorce is granted. But they were living in the same house, Sylvie said. It doesn't matter, they can still be legally separated under the same roof as long as they are not living together as man and wife. Mr. Winters took a mouthful of coffee. They don't have relations, they don't go to family occasions together, they live totally separate lives. So how long had they been separated like that for, do you know? From what I surmised, the two years was growing close, 
and that's what prompted him to have the new will drawn up. Thank you, Mr. Winters, I can't tell you how much help you've been. Anytime, Sylvie, anything you need, just ask. Sylvie felt bad for being tempted to judge her sister as foolish. It was clear now that the man was in love with her, if he was leaving every single dime he had to her. Maybe their love was true. She knew from her own experience that it was easy to fall in love with someone, even an Englisher. Maybe Carmelo had been a womanizer in the past, but everyone can change, and he might have done just that when he met Sabrina. Mr. Winters leaned over closer to Sylvie. I don't have time to tell you here because you'll have to get back to work, but there's something else you should know if you're interested in Carmelo Leonte. Yes, of course I'm interested. I'd like to know anything that you know about him. Mr. Winters neatly arranged his knife and fork on the empty plate. What time do you finish today? I should be off at around four today, unless Bill wants me to stay later. I'll expect you just after four. Tell Bill that you've got an appointment with me. Mr. Winters gave Sylvie a wink. Sylvie smiled and nodded. Will do. Sylvie could hardly wait to hear what Mr. Winters had to say about Carmelo. She was hoping it was something that would help them find out who had killed him. When four o'clock came around she was pleased that she was free to go and did not have to stay longer. She hurried down the road to Mr. Winters' office. She'd been in his office building many times delivering lunches and coffees. Come in, Sylvie. Mr. Winters was just outside his office speaking to the front desk receptionist when Sylvie pushed open the heavy glass door. This way. His office was at the end of the corridor. The suite of offices was housed in an old building. Some of the rough red bricks were left exposed and made a startling contrast with the modern glass and stainless steel of the interior of the office partitions. Take a seat. Mr. Winters had the largest office, being one of two partners in the firm. Apart from his large desk at one end of the room, there was a group of black tub chairs in a circular arrangement. It was these chairs that they sat in as they spoke. You had something to tell me? Oh, I nearly forgot. I bought you a slice of cherry pie. Sylvie leaned down in her bag and handed Mr. Winters the white package. My favorite, thank you, Sylvie. Mr. Winters took the pie and placed it in his small fridge at the far side of the room. For later. He laughed and sat back down in front of Sylvie. What I want to tell you is something that I heard from another lawyer. We lawyers talk about our clients, even though we aren't supposed to. What was it? Sylvie leaned forward. The lawyer was approached by a previous client of Mr. Leonte. The client was unhappy with him and wanted to know his rights and whether or not he could sue Mr. Leonte for anything. What did he do? The client went to him with a commercial real estate opportunity and had Leonte crunch the numbers. That means work out whether it was a good deal or not. Yes, I know. Go on. Leonte told his client that the numbers didn't work and he couldn't recommend the deal. Next thing, his client found out that the property went under contract quite quickly. Months later the client did some checking into the company that bought the property and, can you guess the rest? Leonte was the owner of the company? Yes, the director. The client thought that this was a breach of ethics and approached the lawyer to see if he could be sued. Could he have been sued? Sylvie asked. At best he could have been reported to the accountancy board. Usually accountants and professionals have their own set of criteria they are ethically bound by. He most likely breached their ethics, but legally there was no use going ahead with anything. Leonte could have said that he'd already been considering the property. It was also bought in a company name and not in his own name, which distances him further from any liability. So the man who missed out on the deal would have been very angry? Sylvie asked. Very angry is an understatement from what his lawyer told me. Thank you, Mr. Winters, you've been very helpful. Anytime, Sylvie. I'm here to help and to eat cherry pie. Old Mr. Winters laughed. Chapter 9 Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. 
Knowing that Mrs. Leontay was still in the hospital, after the attempt on her life, Maureen thought it the best opportunity to go to her house and speak to the housekeeper. She went as early as she could, because she knew that Detective Crowley was going to have the housekeeper show him through the house that afternoon. Maureen took a deep breath, said a quick prayer, and knocked on the Leontes' front door. She glanced down at her English clothing and smoothed down her hair, conscious of the fact that her prayer cap was missing. Seconds later, the door opened a crack. Yes. Hello, I'm Mary Templeton. Would Mrs. Leontay be home at the moment? No, I'm afraid not. The housekeeper looked Maureen up and down. Are you selling something? No, I'm not selling anything. Mrs. Leontay told me to come and see her the next time I had a day free. She said she's looking for a cook, and she's interested in using my services. She might be back tomorrow or the day after. Does she have your phone number? I'll tell her you came by. What's your name? Would she authorize you to speak to me? I know she was looking for someone rather quickly, and you'd be doing her a favor. I'm not sure when I'll be free next, I'm very busy. She'll be so disappointed that she missed me. The housekeeper opened the door a little wider and studied Maureen again, from top to toe. Come on in then. Heavens knows that Mrs. Leonte can't cook. It's about time she thought to get someone in. Maureen was led to a living room with large floor-to-ceiling glass windows overlooking a garden. It'll take a weight off my shoulders. I'm no cook either. What a lovely home. Have Mr. and Mrs. Leonte lived here long? The housekeeper lowered her head. Mr. Leonte died just days ago. Maureen gasped and covered her mouth with her two hands. How terrible. I'm so sorry I had no idea. It was a horrible business. Mrs. Leonte was so distraught she had to be hospitalized. She's in the hospital. Maureen asked. The housekeeper nodded. Anyway, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Maud Camry. Maureen shook her hand. Very pleased to meet you. Do you have any references that I can pass on to Mrs. Leonte? I don't need references. Mrs. Leonte has seen my work firsthand. She's been to many, many functions I've cooked at. She really just wanted to show me the kitchen. I can do that. I can show you the kitchen. This way. Maud walked toward the kitchen. As Maureen followed, she noticed that the dress Maud wore was particularly well made. She knew good tailoring when she saw it, since her mother was one of the better seamstresses in the community. Maureen also knew that the silk fabric would have been highly expensive. That's a lovely dress you're wearing, Maud. Maud stopped and turned around. Mrs. Leonte gave it to me. Maud laughed. We're the same size and she gives me all her old clothes. Lucky you, Maureen said. I'd never fit that size. Maureen patted her full hips. She's a size two, same as me. Some of the clothes she gives me have never been worn. It's like that with rich people. Sometimes they're far too free with their money. They don't even know the word budget, do they? Maureen laughed. Do you live in? Yes, well, nearly. I've got the garden house out behind the main house. It's two bedrooms and it's quite roomy. It's funny that Mrs. Leonte didn't mention you. I've met her quite a few times. She's a lovely woman. Lovely? Maud laughed. I've heard her called many things, but not many people would call her lovely. She seemed lovely to me. Maud's face turned serious. She can be lovely and she can be horrid. It depends on what mood she's in. I'm not about to cross her in any way. Of course you wouldn't cross her because she's your boss. Maud smiled. Come on. I'll show you the kitchen, and then I'll give you a quick look over the rest of the house. It's quite grand. Maureen was happy that she was getting along so well with Maud. In real life they might have become friends. Maureen was a little saddened that she was deceiving this lady, just to find out more about Mr. Leonte's murder. Maureen took a deep breath and reminded herself of what she was there for, and followed Maud as she took her on a tour of Mrs. Leonte's home. Well, that's the home, Maud said. It's magnificent. Maud tapped Maureen on the arm. 
I've got loads of free time since Mrs. Leonte's not here. Let's have a nip of sherry. Maureen smiled. She wasn't a drinker. It wasn't forbidden in her community, and many of her Amish friends drank in moderation. Maureen knew she had to keep a level head. Yes, that would be lovely. I have a little time before I have to be somewhere. Excellent. We can enjoy ourselves before Mrs. Leonte gets home. Maureen followed Maud to a formal sitting room. Sit here, Maud said while she walked to the far side of the room and pressed a button under a concave in the wall. A bar rose up out of the floor. Maureen covered her mouth with both hands. Well, I'll be. I've never seen anything like it. Maud laughed. Mrs. Leonte likes her gadgets. She's got a large television screen in the bedroom that comes down from the ceiling at the press of a button. Maureen noticed that Maud said that she has the television screen in the bedroom and not they. Maybe that was because Mr. Leonte was no longer alive, but surely she would have said, they've got a television screen if they were in the same bedroom. For being so early after Mr. Leonte's death, the housekeeper hadn't made one slip with the they when referring to her employers, it was always she. Maureen mulled the whole thing over until she was handed a small glass of sherry in an extremely heavy and expensive-looking cut-glass goblet. The housekeeper sat next to her on the blue brocade chaise. Maureen looked around her and then looked back at the glass. I feel very stylish. Maud laughed. They do know how to live. There it was, the housekeeper had said they. Now Maureen had no reason to believe, no hope to cling to that Mr. and Mrs. Leonte were separated, but living under the one roof. She had no evidence of that at all. She had hoped she could go back and tell the widows and particularly Sabrina that they had lived separately, but she could not. Cheers, Maud said as she lifted up her glass. Cheers, Maureen copied Maud as she sipped the sherry. Very nice. It should be. It's the best that money can buy, Maud said. And they don't mind you drinking it? Maud laughed. What they don't know won't hurt them. I mean what Mrs. Leonte doesn't know won't hurt her. Sylvie dragged Sabrina along to the next widow's meeting, even though Sabrina didn't want to go because she was still cross at having to go to talk to the bishop alone. Sylvie knew it would be beneficial to have Sabrina at the meeting. That night of the murder, how did you know that it was Mrs. Leonte whom you saw? How could you see her face in the dark when she left Carmelo's office? You didn't see her actually in the office, did you? Maureen asked Sabrina. Nay, I didn't actually see her in his office. I heard someone come in and then I heard someone leave. I heard the door downstairs close and I looked out the window. Just as I looked out, I could see her face as she glanced back at the building. I remember her face and it was definitely her. There was also no one else around. Mrs. Leonte's housekeeper, Maud, is given all Mrs. Leonte's old clothing and she takes exactly the same sized clothing. She looks similar to Mrs. Leonte, it would be hard to tell them apart at a distance. The only difference is that the housekeeper is older, but that would be hard to tell in the dark, wouldn't it? What are you saying, Maureen? Do you think that the housekeeper killed him? Why would she? Sabrina asked. And she wouldn't have attacked Mrs. Leonte as well, because if they're both gone she would have no job. Maureen slumped back slightly in her chair, which caused the old wooden chair to creak. I didn't think of that. Eddie said, what else did you find from going around the house, Maureen? Maureen looked at Sabrina. I'm sorry to say that I didn't see any evidence that they had separate bedrooms. In fact, she showed me their bedroom, the master suite she called it, and said nothing of them leading separate lives. Sabrina said nothing and looked sad. How many bedrooms do they have in the house? Emma asked. Couldn't count them. Must have been around ten bedrooms. It is possible that Mr. Leonte used one of the bedrooms as his own. Maureen said, looking at Sabrina. I'm just saying that there was no evidence from what I saw. I didn't look in closets or anything. It's all right, Maureen. You don't have to be careful what you say. I know what I had with him. I know that it was real. Sylvie's got something that she hasn't told you yet. All eyes turned to Sylvie. I told Sabrina as soon as I got home today. Mr. Winters gave me some very useful information. 
It seems that Carmelo had a new will drawn up, one that was never signed. Carmelo was to sign it in front of Mr. Winters the afternoon that he died, and Carmelo never showed up. That's an interesting turn of events. Did he tell you what was in the new will? Elsa May asked. He was leaving everything to Sabrina. Every single thing he owned all to Sabrina, Sylvie said. All eyes turned to Sabrina. See. Sabrina said looking self-satisfied. You all think that he was using me and I was a stupid little fool, just one of his other women but I wasn't. Nay, we don't think that at all, Sabrina. We want to help you, dear, Eddie said. Sabrina smiled at Eddie, which was the first time Sylvie had seen a smile on her face in days. Danka Eddie, Sabrina said. And then he was killed, Elsa May said, obviously talking about the recent will, quite oblivious to the little exchange that Sabrina and Eddie had just had. Yeah, Sylvie continued, he also told me that Carmelo had an extremely disgruntled client who was looking to sue him. Tell us more, Maureen said. Mr. Winters found out from another lawyer that a client of Carmelo's came to ask him whether a property was a good investment. Carmelo told him it wasn't worthwhile to go ahead with, and then Carmelo bought it with one of his companies. Unprofessional, wicked and unethical, Elsa May said. And because he bought it in the company name, that means he was somewhat personally protected from litigation. But technically what he did was most likely not a crime anyway, just wicked and unprofessional. That makes the former client a suspect then, Maureen said. Eddie made a noise from the back of her throat. Now our suspect list, everyone named in the old will including the wife, plus the housekeeper and now the disgruntled client. That's right, Elsa May said as she scribbled notes on her yellow pad. Wasn't Detective Crowley coming here tonight? Sylvie asked. Like clockwork, Detective Crowley knocked on the door. For the next fifteen minutes, Sylvie and Maureen briefed the detective about everything that they had learned. Maureen, I wouldn't say that was a good idea what you did. Showing up at the Leonte house like that. Things like that need to be left to a trained professional. Maureen jutted out her jaw. I found some things out. The detective frowned at Maureen and his cheeks went red. You could have put yourself in danger. Please don't do it again, leave it to us. Maureen smiled through tight lips. Sylvie knew that Maureen would do something like that again, as would they all if the need arose. What did you find out from Mrs. Leonte, detective? Emma asked. She gets out tomorrow if the doctor gives her the all clear. She is going to increase the security on her house by putting in an alarm system and security cameras. Did you go to the house? Maureen asked. I stopped in on the housekeeper and asked to look around the house and she refused. She said that if I wanted to come in or look around that I'd need a warrant. Maureen giggled. Funny that she let me have a look around and I'm not a trained professional. The detective grimaced at Maureen's words. Did you find out whether Mr. and Mrs. Leonte had separate bedrooms? he asked. Maureen did the best she could to stifle her amusement. No, I didn't see that they did, but it was possible, I suppose. There were a lot of bedrooms, and I didn't look in closets or bathroom cabinets. Sylvie added, according to the lawyer they were separated. Well, living separately, not living as man and wife. That's interesting, Detective Crowley said. Sylvie fiddled with the long strings of her prayer cap. Yes, and even more interesting that the two years were nearly up. Their divorce would have been a formality, and it would have made it a lot harder for Mrs. Leonte to formally object to it. It's a little odd that he changed lawyers quickly at the end like that. I'll talk to his old one again tomorrow and also Mr. Winters, Detective Crowley said. Chapter 10 for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 The last thing that Sabrina ever thought she would be doing was going to the bishop's house to confess her sin. She regretted what she had done, which was to have an affair with a married man, even if he was officially separated. Sabrina would have preferred if Carmelo had moved out of the house altogether, but he felt he was entitled to stay because he had owned the house before he married Stephanie. Sabrina shrugged all thoughts of Carmelo off, 
and tried to concentrate on God and the bishop. She knew she needed to get right with God. The fact that Carmelo was separated, and the fact that she was in love with him, would make no difference to the bishop. Sabrina considered that she had no choice but to go through with the shame and the humiliation of speaking to the bishop. If Carmelo had not died, Sabrina would have most likely left the Amish to be with him. Now Sabrina had no good reason to leave the Amish. Now that she stood in front of the bishop's front door about to knock on it, the impact of what she'd done hit her in the stomach. She pressed both hands to her tummy. Don't be sick, don't be sick, she told herself. When Sabrina was with Carmelo, everything seemed good and right. Now that he was gone and she had to tell someone about him and their relationship, it all seemed dirty and sordid. Tears filled Sabrina's eyes as she lifted her hand and knocked on the door. No one would ever know what they had truly had. The bishop was expecting her. Come in, Sabrina. Once they sat down, the bishop said, would you feel more comfortable speaking to your own bishop back in Ohio? Nay, I'm thinking of staying on here with Sylvie. The bishop nodded. What have you come to see me about? Sabrina liked the bishop from the time of her first gathering that she went to with Sylvie. He was an elderly man, but he still had dark hair and a dark bard. His eyes were dark brown and filled with kindness and gentleness. Sabrina was comfortable speaking with him. While Sabrina spoke of her ordeal the bishop nodded and seemed sympathetic. After the bishop heard the whole story he asked, Are you truly sorry? Yeah I am. I'm truly sorry. I was blinded by love and God punished me by taking him away. I can't tell you whether what you say is right or wrong. Sometimes I don't know how the mind of our God works. Maybe he did take Carmelo away from you, and maybe he didn't. The important thing is that you know what you've done wrong, and you confess it to him. Shore up your weaknesses. I will. What punishment will I have? Sabrina was sure that the kindly and sympathetic bishop would give her no punishment. Maybe he would say that she'd already been through enough hurt and pain. You will have to confess to the community what you've done. Sabrina drew in a sharp breath. She would rather be shunned than speak about what she'd done. I have to do that? I would be embarrassed. Everything that is done in secret shall be made known, the scripture says. There is nothing secret with God. Sabrina made a face. The bishop was speaking from scripture, a scripture that Sabrina had not heard of. Do I have to do it? If you want to stay in the community, you must do it. The community is all one. When one suffers, we all suffer. Sabrina nodded. I will then, and then I'd like to be baptized. Sabrina wondered if she should go back to Ohio to be baptized. Maybe if she went back there, no one would ever find out what she'd done, but then she figured the bishop would most likely write a letter to the bishop in Ohio if she suddenly disappeared. No, she should be baptized and live life as she was supposed to live. This Sunday you'll stand before the gathering and speak to the congregation, the bishop said as he scratched his dark bard. Then I'll give you dates for the next instructions. Sabrina nodded once more. Her good name would be ruined, but she would have to stop being bothered at what people thought of her and start thinking about her relationship with God. She didn't much care about being able to find a husband because Carmelo was the only man she could ever see herself with. The widows didn't miss having husbands, they had good lives she could be like one of them. The next Sunday came all too quickly for Sabrina. She stood before the community and confessed what she had done. It wasn't so bad because she knew that soon she would be baptized. No one could judge her. At the end of the meeting she said to her sister, Ah, Sylvie. I feel different. I feel clean. Sylvie smiled. You're about to be born anew. Sabrina rubbed her face. Let's go home. Sabrina. The bishop approached Sabrina and took her aside to have a few words. Then she came back to Sylvie. Can we go now? Sabrina asked. On the way home, Sabrina said, I'm sorry for being so horrible. It's just that everything seems so hard for me. Everything goes your way all the time. I wish I could be more like you. Sylvie's mouth fell open. I don't see that things go right for me any more than they do for you. It's just the way you look at things. 
If you look for good things then that's what you'll see, if you look for bad things then you'll only see the bad. I suppose so. I can't wait to get home and be by myself for a while. It was around the middle of the day that Sabrina and Sylvie arrived home. Sabrina had finished her bath and Sylvie had tended to the horse and made the midday meal. They were just about to sit down to eat when there was a loud banging on their door. On her way to the front door, Sylvie noticed through the window that a taxi was driving away. She opened her front door to see her mother standing on the doorstep with suitcase in hand. Ma'am, what are you doing here? What would you think I'm doing here? She pushed her way past Sylvie and into the house. Sabrina came out of the kitchen. Ma'am. Their mother dumped her small suitcase on the ground. Well, I've heard what you've been up to, Sabrina, and I'm absolutely ashamed of you. Her eyes glistened as they fixed upon Sabrina. Deeply ashamed. You've ruined our family's good name. No one in our family has ever done anything like this, and now we're going to be talked about because of you. She turned to Sylvie. I would have expected something like this of you. She looked back to Sabrina, but not you, Sabrina. Ma'am, I'm going to be baptized and officially join our community, Sabrina said. Their mother collapsed into the couch. What does that matter now? Our name is ruined. How could you? Sylvie sat next to her mother. Ma'am, don't you think it's a good thing that Sabrina is taking the instructions and will be baptized? She's confessed to the gathering and everything. Their mother opened her mouth and her bottom lip quivered. She's what? That means that everyone knows. My life will never be the same. She sobbed into her apron. Sylvie and Sabrina looked at each other, helpless to know what to do. Sylvie said, does it really matter what other people think? Of course it matters, a good name is everything. People will think that Dad and I have been bad parents and have set a bad example. The scripture says that a good name is more prized than great riches. How did you find about it so quickly? Sylvie asked. I heard from someone what Sabrina had done, but I didn't know she had confessed it to the congregation. That's good though, isn't it? That's what the bishop asked her to do, Sylvie said. Through sobs she said, wait till I tell your dad. It would be better if she hadn't done that terrible thing to begin with, then she wouldn't have brought shame and disgrace on the family. Dad and I have done all we can to bring you children up proper. Her mother cried bitterly into her apron, then brought her head up again. And then this happens. Sabrina crouched down beside her. Sorry, ma'am. Too late for sorries. How long are you staying, ma'am? Sabrina asked. I'm taking you back with me, Sabrina. We leave the day after tomorrow. Nay, I'm not going. I'm staying here with Sylvie. I've got it all worked out. I'm going to get a job here and live with Sylvie. Their mother glared at Sylvie. How could you have let this happen? How could I stop it? I knew nothing of it. Sylvie wrung her hands. You should have kept a better watch on your sister. I thought I didn't have to worry about her being away from home because she was with you. Now I know that it was the worst thing ever. I'll go and make up the bed for you. Sylvie left her mutter downstairs while she tended to the spare bedroom upstairs. After a few moments Sabrina burst into the spare bedroom. I fixed ma'am a cup of tea, that should keep her quiet for a while. Sylvie, how did ma'am find out so soon? I thought it would have taken at least a week for word to get to her. They've got a phone now, haven't they? Sylvie asked. Yeah, ma'am and dad got a phone installed in the barn before I left. Someone's called them, I'd say. I have no idea who. Maybe the bishop's sister. She's a bit of a gossip and a meddler. Sylvie looked up from making the bed. Don't worry about it. We'll most likely never find out who told her. At least now you can get her scolding out of the way. You'd have to face it sooner or later. I guess so, Sabrina said. You'd better go back down and speak to her or she'll think we're up here talking about her. Sabrina giggled. We are. Okay, I'll go down and talk to her. We don't want to upset her any more than we have to. Good. How long do you think she'll stay? Sylvie asked. 
I think she'll try and make me go back with her. She'll stay until she sees it's useless. Sylvie's shoulders drooped downward. That might be a while then. Sabrina slowly walked the stairs back down to her unhappy mutter. Sylvie unfolded the spare quilt that she used in the guest room, shook it out, and let it fall softly over the bed. Once she was satisfied that her mutter would be happy with the room, she sat on the bed wishing she did not have to go downstairs. It was bad enough her sister staying with her, but it was her worst nightmare that her mutter had come to stay. She had never been close with her mother as her friends were close to theirs. Sylvie's mother always found things wrong with her, nothing Sylvie did was ever right. In her eyes the single thing that Sylvie ever did correctly was to marry John. John had been her choice, and Sylvie had gone along with her mother's wishes. Sylvie was happy enough to marry John, she had never found another man that she had liked more and she was getting older. She knew that the older she got, the less choice she would have in regard to choosing a husband. Her mother urged her to accept John's offer to marry rather than be left on the shelf. A storm of angry words coming from her mother and her sister forced Sylvie off the bed. She took a long slow deep breath and then made her way downstairs. When she reached the two of them, she saw that her mother had a bunch of Bailey's letters in her hand. Sylvie froze in horror. Sabrina looked over to Sylvie. I tried to stop her. I came down here and she was reading your letters. Sylvie put her hand to her throat and raced toward her mother. Ma'am, those letters are mine and they're private. Her mother leapt to her feet and put the letters behind her back. He's an Englisher. You've been speaking of love to an Englisher. No wonder Sabrina got herself into trouble. I knew you'd be behind this somewhere. It's your fault that Sabrina got involved with that terrible man, I told Dad that it would be all your fault. Sylvie grabbed the letters out of her mother's hands. Sabrina said, it's nothing to do with Sylvie. She didn't even know that I was seeing him. She's been nothing but good to me. Mutter, you are welcome to stay the night, but tomorrow first thing I am putting you in a taxi and you are going back home on the Greyhound bus. Her mother gasped. Your mother is not welcome in your home. I've never heard such a thing. My bus tickets are for the day after tomorrow. Well, I'm sure they can be changed. Sylvie left her mother and sister staring at her open-mouthed as she stomped into the kitchen. Sylvie had never spoken angrily to either of them. Sabrina ran after her. Are you all right, Sylvie? I couldn't stop her reading the letters. She found them in the writing bureau while we were speaking upstairs. I know it's not your fault. I'm just glad she's going tomorrow, Sylvie said. You don't mind if I stay on, do you? Sabrina asked. Nay, not at all. You can stay. Sylvie was genuine in her response to Sabrina. She would rather live alone, but if it helped Sabrina start a new life, then she was more than happy to help her. Danka. What a day it's been. I get baptized and ma'am comes here on the very same day. She must have missed her own gathering to come here, Sabrina said while Sylvie served the food for the midday meal. Chapter 11 Ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Matthew chapter 7 verses 7 to 8 Amidst her mother's protests, Sylvie deposited her mother safely in a taxi the next morning, and went to visit Emma on the way home. She hoped Emma would be home and not off on one of her visits to town. Sylvie breathed a sigh of relief to see Emma out in front of her house sweeping the porch. Emma looked up and waved at Sylvie. She left the broom leaning against the side of the house and went to meet her. Hello, Sylvie. It was lovely to see Sabrina baptized yesterday. That's not all that happened yesterday. Sylvie secured her horse to the side fence rail. Come inside and tell me, Emma said. Sylvie followed Emma into the house. Now tell me what else happened. Mrs. Leonte didn't come back again, did she? Emma asked once they were both seated comfortably in the living room. Nay, it was my mother. She turned up on the doorstep, didn't care that Sabrina is going to be baptized, and she chastised her for seeing a married man. She shouldn't have done it, but under these circumstances Sabrina must feel awful. That's not all. 
Ma'am found and read the letters that Bailey wrote to me. She started to say horrid things to me. I'm sure she thinks what Sabrina did was my fault. Emma shook her head. Nay, she wouldn't think that. Yeah, she even said so. She said that she told my dad that it would be all my fault somehow. Anyway, I've just come from putting her in a taxi to take her to the bus station. Emma giggled. That was a quick visit. Too long for me. Anyway, the reason I've stopped by is because I'd like you to come with me to see Detective Crowley. He said that he'd go and see the lawyer who drew up the new will, Mr. Winters, and also the other lawyer, the one who did the old will. I'm anxious to know what he's found out. Yeah, I'll come with you. Sylvie knew that Emma would be reluctant to go and see Crowley, as she was always saying to Elsa May that he made her feel uneasy. She was glad when Emma agreed to go with her. Good Denka. Ride with me and I'll bring you back home, Sylvie said. Sylvie was grateful to have a friend like Emma. She could have asked Maureen but Maureen was working. Emma did not have to work because she lived on the money she received from leasing out her farm to Bob Pluver. I'll make us a pot of tea before we go. Emma asked. A wave of relaxation came over Sylvie. I'd love a cup. Come with me to the kitchen. While Sylvie sat at Emma's long kitchen table, she wondered if she would ever plan another wedding as Emma was. Are you excited about your wedding, Emma? Emma had already put the kettle on the stove, and now she was fixing the tea leaves. I think I am getting a little excited. It's a new beginning. Will decided not to build us a house. He's been looking for one that we can buy and rebuild to suit us. It'd be nice to have a man around all the time, one you can rely on. It can't be easy for you and Bailey, especially since you don't know for sure whether he will join the community, Emma said. It is hard, but there's no one in the community for me, so it's not as if I'm passing other men up while I'm waiting for him. Sylvie giggled. I have you in my prayers. Danka, Emma. You and Will are always in mine too. Emma smiled. Everything will work out for you, just you wait and see. Sylvie slouched and her shoulders drooped. Things haven't been easy lately with Sabrina and her problems. I mean, she's not the easiest person to be around without the entire recent goings-on. Then with Ma'am coming, I felt that I would explode. Have you ever felt like that? Emma sat down next to Sylvie and placed the teacups on the table. I didn't ask, I just gave you chamomile. It's calming on your nerves. Danka. To answer your question, Yah, I've often felt like that. Sometimes when one bad thing happens it seems to lead to another then another. Sometimes there seems no end in sight. Emma took a sip of tea. How do you cope with problems, Emma? You always seem so serene and at peace. Emma gave a laugh. I think about the tide. When I'm going through tough times, I tell myself that the tide is out. But you know what? The tide always comes back in. The further out it has been, the further it has to come back in. Like the tide of the seashore? Sylvie asked. Yeah, the tide of the seashore. Tough times never last, you just have to wait for them to stop and then the good times will come back to you. Danka, Emma. I'll look at things that way. My tide is way out at the moment, I'll hope for the change. Cookies. Emma asked. Thought you'd never ask. Emma brought a plate of cookies out of the ice box and placed it on the table. Two cookies each, a cup of tea and a buggy ride into town later, they were in Detective Crowley's office. Morning ladies, have a seat. I guess you ladies are here for an update? Once both ladies agreed that was why they were there, the detective continued, I saw Mr. Winters early this morning, and I saw Mr. Piper, Carmelo's original lawyer, on Friday. Mr. Piper had no knowledge of a new will, and had no idea why he chose a different lawyer to draw the will up, and he appeared offended. Mr. Winters didn't have much information for me, he did confirm all that he had already told you, Sylvie. Both ladies looked at each other. Are there any updates on anything? Sylvie asked. Mrs. Leonte is out of the hospital, and the funeral for her husband is on Wednesday. That's the only update I have so far. Except that the business partner turned up on Friday afternoon. 
he was called out of town on the very day that Carmelo died. Claims that it was last minute and that he let Carmelo know mid-morning. Carmelo was to pass it on to the rest of the staff that he'd be gone for a time, but he didn't have a chance, did he? Why was he out of town? Emma asked. Claims his father was sick in a hospital in Cleveland. We're looking into his story now. Sabrina said they fought quite a bit. Did you know that? Sylvie asked. The detective scratched the side of his head with a pencil. Yes, I heard that when I was at Elsa May and Eddie's place. According to him, they didn't have any major fights or arguments, just very minor disagreements. He wasn't aware of the client whom Carmelo essentially cheated out of that property. He knew nothing about the purchase, and he was not involved in the company that purchased it. You don't think that he's a possible suspect in Carmelo's death? Emma asked. We'll have to wait until we check out his story about his father being in the hospital. I've got people looking into it. I'll know later today. Is there anything at all that we can do to help? Sylvie asked. The detective leaned back in his swivel chair and crossed his arms. You ladies are not to go around poking your noses in. I don't mind hearing what gossip you might have overheard, but I do not want you sticking your noses where they don't belong. He looked deliberately and slowly from one lady to the other. Stick to baking cookies. I'm going to the funeral on Wednesday. That's generally a good place to get some leads and find out what's really going on. Mrs. Leonte doesn't mind you going? Emma asked. She doesn't know. I'll just show up and observe the goings-on. Generally in a murder case, people like to surmise. I'll be around to hear their theories and assumptions over who murdered him. Let Elsa May know that I'll be around to visit you ladies at her place at 7 sharp, Wednesday. Wednesday evening? It's only Monday. Is there some little tiny thing that we can do in the meantime? Sylvie asked. Emma nodded in agreement and said, We'll feel useless if we sit around and wait for Wednesday night. The detective was silent for a while. No, can't think of one thing that either of you ladies can do. Leave it to the professionals. If you want to try and figure things out, take a look at this. The detective handed them a sheet of paper that had been lying to one side of his desk. These are Carmelo's movements on the last day of his life. There has to be a clue in there somewhere, he had to have ingested the poison that day. The detective rose to his feet. Let me know if you find anything out. Chapter 12 By faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8 Sylvie and Emma left the detective's office and went straight to Elsa May and Eddie's house to tell them to expect the detective on Wednesday night. Wednesday night was often the night that the widows got together anyway. I'm stumped, Elsa May said. I have no idea who might have killed him. I think there might be a clue in his changing the will. That was a fairly big move. We should look at finding out who knew about the change. Eddie moved to the edge of her chair. Why did he change lawyers too? I nearly forgot, Sylvie said. The detective gave us this. She pulled out the piece of paper and handed it to Elsa May. Everything he did on that last day is listed. Crowley must have got the information from Carmelo's secretary or his work diary. Elsa May's eyes scanned the piece of paper. He started at nine, made an appointment with Mr. Winter, then he made two other phone calls. After he went to Mr. Winter's office, he came back and had back-to-back -back appointments until 5 p.m. Eddie said, Now, Sylvie, I think you should have Sabrina go talk to Miss Scottsdale and Miss Tobro. See what she can find out. She would have a common bond with them, since it seems they all had a close relationship with Mr. Leonte. Do you think she should? Sylvie asked. She's very emotional at the moment. Elsa May's face lit up. You could do it then, Sylvie. Pretend to be Sabrina, no one will know. Neither of these women would have met Sabrina. Besides, you're closer to Carmelo's age. I heard he was in his late thirties. Sylvie lowered her head. What other things did she have to endure? Normally, she wouldn't have minded, but all this was a little too close to home. 
Eddie said, I've got a good idea, Sylvie. I think you should go posing as Sabrina. Elsa May's mouth dropped open. I just said that. Eddie frowned and stared at her. When? Just then. Elsa May looked around at everyone. Didn't I? Everyone heard me. What are you playing at, Eddie? I wasn't listening to you. I was thinking about what I was going to say next. Elsa May shook her head. See what I have to put up with. It wonders me that I'm... Sylvie interrupted, all right, I'll do it. She agreed for two reasons. She couldn't listen to any more back and forth, and Sabrina was in no mental state to pull off something like that. Eddie walked slowly over to the top drawer of the dresser and pulled out a piece of paper. These are the two girls' addresses. Sylvie took the paper from Eddie, she didn't bother to ask how she got the addresses. She knew that Eddie was a whiz at finding things out. She most likely made a trip to the voter registration office and talked them into giving her the information. Visit one tonight and one tomorrow. That way you can spread it out a little, Elsa May suggested. You can even wear your own clothing this time. Since Sabrina is Amish and if they have heard of her it won't be odd, Eddie added, with a wide smile crinkling the lines in her cheeks even further. I don't have to work today, but I do have to work tomorrow afternoon. I guess Elsa May is right. It makes sense if I go visit one of them tonight and the other in the morning, Sylvie said. That's the way, Elsa May said. Sylvie rose to her feet. I'd better get Emma home and get back home myself and see what Sabrina is up to. On the way to Emma's house, Sylvie said to Emma, you were very quiet back there. I was feeling a little tense for you having to go and see those two women, the two previous girlfriends of Carmelo, pretending to be Sabrina. Sylvie shrugged her shoulders. I'll try not to think about it. I'll just do it. What if they're angry? Emma asked. They shouldn't be angry. They got money in the will, so I'd think they'd be pretty happy about that. They wouldn't know that he was close to signing a new will, leaving it all to Sabrina. Or, do you think that they might still be in love with Carmelo and think that Sabrina came between them? Emma nibbled on the end of a fingernail. I don't know, could be. Sylvie pressed her lips tightly together and drew a deep breath inwards. I'll have to go and see, won't I? Once Sylvie told Sabrina that she was going to speak to Miss Scottsdale and Miss Tobrel and why, Sabrina was grateful. Miss Scottsdale's apartment was too far away to travel by buggy, so Sylvie would have to take a taxi. Sylvie pulled the jam jar down from the very top shelf and counted out her money. Taxis were expensive, and things had been a little tight with her uncertain hours at the bakery and the extra mouth to feed. Here you are, Sylvie. Sylvie looked up to see that Sabrina had a fistful of notes in her outstretched hand. Where did you get that money from? I saved it from raising chickens back home. Take it. Sylvie looked at the money she had counted out, and it was enough to get to where she was going in a taxi, but may not have been enough for her to get back home. She looked back at Sabrina. Are you sure? Of course I am. You're doing it for me, after all. Sylvie took the money. Danka, Sabrina. I didn't know that you raised chickens. You could do that here. We could build a pen out back. We've got just enough room if we transplant the vegetables closer to the fence. Yeah, I'd like that, and I'll get a job as well. A horn blew from outside their house. It was the taxi that Eddie had booked, and it was right on time. Pray for me, Sabrina. I'm nervous. I will. While the taxi drove towards Miss Scottsdale's house, Sylvie played over in her mind how she thought things would happen when she got there. She would take a deep breath, lift up her heavy hand and knock on the door of Miss Scottsdale's apartment. Hello. The woman would say, as she looked Sylvie up and down wondering who she was. Sylvie would respond with, Are you Miss Scottsdale? Yes. You don't know me, but I'm Sabrina Tildy. Sylvie would burst into fake tears right on cue. What's the matter? Miss Scottsdale would most likely ask. Sylvie would look at her through the tears in her eyes. Have you heard about Carmelo? Yes, did you know him too? I was his girlfriend. 
Sylvie would crank her crying up a notch to gain the woman's sympathy. Oh dear. Don't cry, come inside. Sylvie would walk into the apartment. Please sit down. Sylvie would sit and then say, I'm sorry to come here unexpectedly like this, it's just that Carmelo used to speak of you and I feel like I know you. The woman would smile, flattered that Carmelo would still speak of her, think of her. He spoke of me? Sylvie would nod, and at that point Miss Scottsdale would rise from her seat and fetch Sylvie some tissues. Thank you, Sylvie would say and then ask, were you Carmelo's girlfriend too? I know you worked for him. Then Miss Scottsdale would proceed to tell her all about her relationship with Carmelo, and hopefully other information that Sylvie could use, so the widows and Detective Crowley might be able to figure out who murdered Carmelo Leonte. Fifteen minutes later, Sylvie stood outside Miss Scottsdale's door for real. She knocked on the door, just as she had imagined. The door opened and instead of Miss Scottsdale, a young man stood there in front of her. Can I help you? He asked as he looked Sylvie up and down just as she had imagined that Miss Scottsdale would. Is Miss Scottsdale home? She's in New Zealand meeting Ryan's parents. They decided to get married just last week. Are you a friend of Carmen's? No, I don't really know her. Ryan's her boyfriend? The man nodded. Yes. He reached out his hand. I'm Chad, Carmen's brother. Sylvie shook his hand and felt relaxed by his kind smile. What do you want with her? Was she thinking of running away to join the Amish at some stage? Before Sylvie could answer, he added, she's always doing something crazy. I'm here to tell her some distressing news. I'm not sure if she's heard, but her old boss was murdered. Leonte. Sylvie nodded. The man stepped back into the apartment. Come in. All of a sudden Sylvie felt lightheaded. Under no other circumstances would she enter an apartment with an unknown Englisher, but if she didn't what chance would she have of finding out any other information? Just as she had imagined, Sylvie was asked to have a seat, but this time there were no tears in her eyes and no Miss Scottsdale. What is your interest in my sister and Mr. Leonte? Sylvie remembered she was still masquerading as her sister, Sabrina. I was in a relationship with Mr. Leonte before he was murdered. Do you know that he left a portion of his wealth to your sister? Bad news, I'm sorry to hear it. Carmen did hear of his death. He told her that he would leave her something, but she didn't know whether to believe it or not. She certainly wasn't relying on it or anything. He leaned back in the chair and placed his right ankle across his left knee. They had a relationship back when she was working for him. The wife found out and made him fire her. She sued him for sexual harassment out of revenge for being dumped, and then he talked her into dropping the suit. Did you ever meet him? Sylvie asked out of interest. I met him briefly once. He seemed a decent sort of character, except for the fact that he was married while he was having a relationship with Carmen. It was her life, who was I to tell her what to do? Sylvie tried to think of more questions. Who killed him, he asked. Sylvie shrugged her shoulders. They don't know yet. Carmen should be back in a week. Shall I have her call you? Do you know of anyone who wished Carmelo harm? Did your sister ever mention anything? Chad was silent for a while, then shook his head. It's a wonder I haven't had a visit from the cops. I think you will very shortly, Sylvie said. But please don't mention to them that I was here. They think I'm meddling, and they'll get angry with me again. I'm just trying to help them, but they don't see it that way. Sylvie stood up and Chad stood up as well. Chad said, I won't say anything. Anyway, Carmen's the one they would want to speak with. I know nothing. Sylvie managed to smile. You've been very helpful. Could you do one more thing for me? What's that? Call me a taxi? On the way home. Sylvie thought over everything that Chad had said. He really did not give her any new information except that Carmen sued Carmelo out of revenge and that Mrs. Leonte had found out about their affair. Sylvie closed her eyes and dozed for the rest of the drive home. Chapter 13 But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him.
Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. Sylvie had one more thing to do and that was to find out what she could from Miss Tobrel, the other ex-girlfriend of Carmelo who was named in the will. Before she started work the next day she knocked on Miss Tobrel's door. There was no answer. Sylvie used her time to go back to see Mr. Winters. As soon as she got there, the secretary showed her into his office. He seemed pleased to see her as she sat down in front of him. Mr. Winters, is there anyone at all who could have known about the new will? Mr. Winters shook his head. Not even my secretary knew what was in it. She wouldn't have known until after it was signed and it was ready for filing. The reason for that was that it was such a simple will with only one beneficiary. I just filled out his details on a pro forma and printed it out ready for him to sign. Couldn't he have signed it at the same appointment then? I'm a little slow with my typing. He could have signed it then and there, but he said he had a busy day. I said I'd stay late for him to come after work. He agreed to meet me here just after 5 p.m. No one else could see it in any way, shape, or form. Sylvie asked. I did email it to him, as a formality. Email. Sylvie thought for a while and then said aloud. I wonder who had access to his email. Maybe his secretary? No, I remember now. He had two email addresses, and I sent it to his private email. Every time we have a new client, we have them fill out their details on a new client sheet. I remember that he had two emails, one marked personal and one marked work. Thank you, Mr. Winters. You've been a marvelous help. All Sylvie had to do now was find out who had access to Carmelo's private email. Oh, one more thing, Mr. Winters. Can you tell me what time exactly that you sent the email? I'll look it up right now and tell you. Mr. Winters tilted his computer screen toward him and pressed some buttons. It was 12.30 p.m., and I put a receipt on it which tells me what time it was opened. It was read at 12.45 p.m. A cold shiver ran down Sylvie's spine. What if someone else read that email and found out that they were not in the new will? Can you tell me what the email said? I'll print it out for you. Mr. Winters walked to the printer on the other side of the office and picked up the page as it printed out. He handed it to Sylvie and she read it out. Attached is a copy of your last will and testament. Sabrina Tildy is named as your sole beneficiary. As agreed, I will see you just after five today for signing. Sylvie looked up to Mr. Winters. Do you mind if I hang on to this? By all means. I hope it helps. Sylvie folded the page in two. I'm sure it will help. On Wednesday night at the next widow's gathering, the ladies sat waiting for Detective Crowley. Eddie and Elsa May asked Sylvie what she learned from visiting the ex-girlfriends, Miss Scottsdale and Miss Tobrel. Both of them weren't home when I went to see them. I talked to Carmen Scottsdale's brooder and he said she's getting married soon and was off meeting the future in-laws. He said that Mrs. Leontay knew about his sister's relationship with her husband, and she denies knowledge of any of his relationships. Okay, not a word to Crowley that you went to see them. We'll use that information when we need to. He won't be happy, and if you've no information to give him there's no point us saying anything to him," Elsa May said. Sylvie agreed, and at that point there was a loud knock on the door that could only be Detective Crowley. The detective dusted off his shoes on the front doormat before he entered the house. He took a seat on a wooden chair and shared his updates on the murder. The business partner was telling the truth, about his father at least. His father was in a hospital in Cleveland, and we have Neville Banks' credit card records showing that he was en route to Cleveland at the time of Carmelo's death. I really learned nothing at the funeral, there were surprisingly few people there. Could he have poisoned Carmelo before he left? Emma asked. The poison is not instantaneous, so it's possible he could have poisoned him. Look at this. Elsa May handed the detective the email Mr. Winters sent Carmelo, with the copy of the will attached. While the detective read the email, Elsa May said, Don't you think it's possible that someone found out that they would be left out of the new will? Yes, and if it was Mrs. Leonte, she knew she would have a fight on her hands in court to keep the money, Eddie said. This is enough to allow me to get a warrant on Mrs. Leonte's house. 
Wouldn't the fact that Mr. Leonte has been murdered be enough to allow you to search his house? Sylvie asked. Normally, depends who you go to to sign off on the warrant. Judge Bower's usually good for granting warrants, but he's away till next month. There's really only Judge Peters, and she's a stickler for not invading privacy. This'll be enough to tip her over the edge. Crowley stared at the paper. I will have every computer removed from the house, and I'll have the computer team go right over them. If she did this, then she'd have motive. What about the other two women who would have been left out of the will? Eddie asked. Of course, I'll get warrants for their houses as well, but it's more likely that it's Mrs. Leonte. Carmelo might have had a computer at his home, where his personal emails went. Most people are automatically logged into their emails on their personal computers, which would make knowledge of a password unnecessary. The other two women would have only been able to access his emails by password unless he had a personal computer at their place, which is unlikely, as he wasn't in a continuing relationship with either of the women. The detective looked at each of the widows. There's a good chance that whoever opened this email is the same person who killed him. They would have needed access to him pretty soon after they read it too, wouldn't they? He sent the email at 12.30 p.m. How long does that poison have to take effect? Emma asked. The poison in the dosage he was given takes three to four hours to take effect. We know that he had back-to-back -back appointments that afternoon until 5 p.m. The receptionist left at 4.30 p.m., and Carmela was alive when she left. Detective, how can we find out what he ate at work? Since he didn't go out, he must have had lunch in his office. Can you go to his office and find out exactly what he ate that day? Have you done that yet? Elsa May asked. Yes, we've tested everything in the office kitchen and everything in the office fridge. There's no more we can do. Was there any takeout ordered, or any takeout that came into the office that day? Eddie asked. The detective noted it in his book. I'll check all the nearby cafes and check the logs of the reception for that day. I'll have the team go back and check for residue in all the wastebaskets in every office of the suite. Detective, weren't all the wastebaskets in the office checked for poison when the forensic team first came in the day they found him? Elsa May asked. The detective answered, only the ones in his personal office and in the kitchen. Elsa May raised her eyebrows, and Sylvie knew that Elsa May was thinking that all wastebaskets should have been searched at the beginning of the investigation and not days later. The next day, Detective Crowley made a surprise visit to Sylvie's house. Sylvie and Sabrina sat in front of him. We have a development in the case. There was a lunch order that came in for Carmelo's business partner, Neville Banks. The secretary remembers that since Neville wasn't in, Carmelo ate his lunch. He was seen in Neville's office. Traces of aconitine were found in Neville's office. Which leads me to believe that someone was trying to kill Neville Banks. Carmelo was nothing more than an innocent bystander. That means that Neville would be in danger. Sylvie said. That's right, you would have no way of knowing. Detective Crowley lowered his head. I'm afraid last night Mr. Banks had a car accident. His brake lines were cut, he plowed into a tree after he lost control of his vehicle. Sabrina hid her face and sobbed, why why? We have a suspect in custody, and we found aconitine in his car. The man we have in custody is a known hitman. The two women looked at him blankly until he explained, that means he is paid to kill people. Both women gasped. I never knew of such a thing, Sylvie said. I'm afraid there are people like that out there, Detective Crowley said. So, it wasn't Mrs. Leonte or any of the other women? Detective Crowley shook his head. Mr. Leonte was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Why would someone want to have Mr. Banks dead? Sylvie asked. Gambling. He was addicted to gambling and borrowed heavily to cover his debts. He had his house heavily mortgaged and on top of that a $300,000 personal loan, which he was months behind in. It's evident that he also borrowed money from some very dangerous people. I'll tell the rest of the ladies tonight what you found out. Sylvie called an emergency widows meeting that night, so she could tell everyone at the same time what she'd learned from the detective. Then they could put the matter to rest. 
Before anyone said anything, Maureen began by saying, I am positive that Mrs. Leonte did it. I saw Mrs. Leonte's housekeeper, Maud, driving a very expensive looking car. I checked with the motor vehicle department, and it's registered in Maud's own name. Mrs. Leonte is not generous with money, that's evident in her money struggles with Mr. Leonte. It seems to me that Mrs. Leonte paid her for her silence. Mrs. Leonte probably faked that knife attack and there was no attack on her at all. Elsa May said, Ya Maureen. I never believed that there was any real knife attack. I think Mrs. Leonte had the housekeeper cut her here and there to make it look as though she had been attacked. Maybe she got the housekeeper to deliver a poisoned lunch to the office, and that's why she's been paid off with that car. I agree with Maureen, Mrs. Leonte killed her husband. That seems right. If someone wanted to kill her with a knife, then they'd just do it. She'd be too small from what I've been told of her to fend off a knife-wielding assailant, Eddie said. Sylvie was glad that she made Sabrina stay at home, because all this talk might have upset her. She held up both hands. Stop everyone. I called this meeting because Crowley found out who killed Carmelo. A hush fell over the room. No one wanted to kill him at all. Sylvie said. That's not true, we found plenty of people who wanted him dead, Eddie said. Sylvie shook her head. Nay, just listen to me. Neville Banks was killed last night. He had his brakes in his car cut. Crowley found out that someone had been paid to kill him for unpaid gambling debts. When Neville went to visit his father unexpectedly, he had already ordered his lunch that day. Carmelo ate his lunch since Neville wasn't there to eat it. They even found the same poison residue in Neville's wastebasket. He must have eaten the lunch in Neville's office and thrown the wrapper or the package in the trash. Elsa May's mouth downturned at the corners. Carmelo wasn't murdered deliberately? Sylvie shook her head. They have a suspect in custody, and they found the same poison in his car. The same poison that caused Carmelo's death. Well, that's that then, Emma said. How's Sabrina coping with the news? Sylvie fiddled with her apron strings. She feels no better. Maybe even a little worse that it was all a mistake. I'm not satisfied, Maureen said. Why does the housekeeper have a new car? I don't trust Mrs. Leonte one little bit. You've never met her though, Maureen, Emma said. I've a hunch. I've just a hunch that Mrs. Leonte hired someone to kill Neville Banks to cover her tracks after she murdered her husband. Maybe it was true that Neville was a gambler and borrowed money, but what if he was just a decoy to throw the cops off finding the real killer? We know she lied about being unaware of her husband's indiscretions. Maureen said, you might be on to something, Maureen, said Elsa May. Why don't I pass that scenario by Detective Crowley? I'll suggest he goes to Mrs. Leonte and pretend that the hitman whom they have in custody has given her name as the person who hired him. Nay, that wouldn't be right. It sounds to me that you all want Mrs. Leonte to be the murderer. Why don't you just believe that it was Neville Banks that they were after? Emma asked. Because, dear innocent Emma, if a hired hitman wants someone killed, they don't deliver a poisoned lunch to someone's office and risk that someone else might eat it. They are not so hit and miss, pardon the pun. They shoot to kill, Elsa May said. You could be right, Elsa May, you too, Maureen. I didn't even consider it. Sylvie pushed her prayer cap up on her head a little. I'll call Crowley first thing in the morning and run what we've said by him. Then we'll all meet back here tomorrow night, and have Crowley come and tell us what he's found out, Elsa May said. Don't forget to tell him that Maud, the housekeeper, has a brand spanking new expensive car. She wouldn't be able to afford that on her wage, Maureen said. Elsa May nodded. Chapter 14 Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 11 the very next night, Crowley had some news for the ladies when he arrived at Elsa May and Eddie's house. I've quite a lot to tell you, ladies. We confiscated all the cell phones and all the computers at the residences of Mrs. Leonte, Miss Scottsdale, and Miss Tobril. And what did you find out, Detective? Elsa May asked. As I suspected, 
Mr. Leontay's computer at his residence was automatically logged in and was read from the computer at the house. Mr. Leontay was nowhere near his house that day, so the email must have been read by someone at the house. Sylvie gasped. Did you speak to Mrs. Leontay? I called Mrs. Leonte into the office and told her that we know that she opened that email, and we were able to tell her at what time the email was opened. I also told Mrs. Leonte that the man we've got in custody implicated her when he confessed that she hired him to kill Mr. Banks and her husband. The detective chuckled. It wasn't true, of course, we don't have a confession from him yet. She denied it and refused to speak to us any further. We let her leave the station, and we had a patrol car standing by ready to bring the housekeeper in before Mrs. Leonte had time to communicate with her. We told the housekeeper that Mrs. Leonte had confessed. We offered the housekeeper a deal if she testified against Mrs. Leonte, and she agreed. Now we have a full statement from the housekeeper. Everyone was quiet except Elsa May. She did it. Mrs. Leonte killed him? I knew it, I just knew it. You were right about the car. The car was a payoff for her silence. Detective Crowley said. Wasn't the lunch labeled for Mr. Banks? How would Mrs. Leonte know that Mr. Banks wouldn't be there? Emma asked. It appears Mrs. Leonte thought to cover her tracks from the very beginning. We may never find that out, but somehow she found out that Mr. Banks wouldn't be there. I'm confused, Emma said to the detective. Mrs. Leonte wasn't trying to kill Neville Banks? The detective laughed. She had to kill Neville in the end to cover her tracks. She knew her husband would eat that meal because she somehow found out that Neville Banks would not be in the office. She knew her husband wouldn't let good food go to waste. In labeling the food for Neville, it made it look as though Neville was the target. The man who cut the brakes to Neville's car was the same man who delivered the lunch full of poison. Emma nodded. Detective Crowley continued his explanation. When we did not make the connection with the meal in the first instance, we started to question Mrs. Leonte. She couldn't tell us that we missed the evidence and ruined her little plan, so she had to stage that knife attack to cause us to stop looking in her direction. It was only when poor old Banks was killed that we made the connection to the poison in the meal. I guess she thought we'd think that her husband's death was an accident, and we very nearly did. Mrs. Leonte nearly got away with murder. So what was it that gave her away? What was it that led you to believe that she did it? Emma asked. It was the email being opened from the computer in the house when Mr. Leonte was nowhere near the house at the time. It was also the fact that the housekeeper was driving an unusually expensive car. Thank you, Maureen, for your keen observation. The detective smiled at Maureen. Maureen smiled back at him and said, what a wicked woman. She also killed poor Mr. Banks who had nothing to do with anything. The detective slowly nodded. Wicked indeed. We're working on getting a statement from the man we're holding, the man who cut the brakes. He'll possibly talk now that we've got the housekeeper's statement. Well done, Detective, Eddie said. Yes, thank you, Detective. Sabrina will be pleased that justice will be done, Sylvie said. The detective gave a low chuckle. The quarter that Sabrina's got coming to her will no doubt become a third if Mrs. Leonte is convicted. After Eddie brought the food out, and after the detective ate two pieces of fudge he got up to leave. Detective, why don't you take some fudge home to your wife? The detective hung his head and murmured in a low voice, I'm not married. I thought by your age you'd be married, Elsa May said in her usual candid way. In my line of work, it's hard for a woman. I work long hours and don't have much free time. Most women find that difficult. The widows all stared at him as he tipped his head and walked out the door. Imagine, a man of his age not being married, Eddie said. I might make him a few meals that he can freeze. Yeah, he works long hours. How would he eat without a wife to cook for him? Maureen asked. Sylvie could not think about Crowley and his stomach. She wanted to go home and be with Sabrina. I'll go home now and tell Sabrina everything. Danka everyone for helping with this. When Sylvie arrived home, she sat down with Sabrina and told her everything she'd found out. In a way, it makes me feel better that the truth has been told, Sabrina said. 
Sylvie put her arm around her sister. I'm sorry that you've been through something so awful at your young age. It's my own fault for making bad choices. From now on, I'll not do anything that I could not stand up and tell the congregation of. Sylvie grimaced. Yeah, that must have been awful. It was, but now I know why the bishop made me do it. Now I feel clean and can live my life the way that God would want me to live. Sabrina bounded to her feet. I forgot to tell you, this arrived today. Sabrina retrieved a letter from the top of the bureau. Sylvie took the letter from her. She knew at once that it was another letter from Bailey. Sabrina walked out of the room while Sylvie pulled the letter in toward her heart. Was she at risk of making the same mistake that Sabrina had made? Was God trying to warn her not to get involved with this Englisher? After all, what guarantee did she have that Bailey was ever going to join the community? She placed the letter on the couch beside her, pulled her knees up under her full dress and hugged them to her chest. She knew she was one step away from falling into something from which there would be no return. Sylvie saw what love had done to Sabrina. It had made her lose all sense and control. As Sylvie ripped the envelope open, her heart felt just as torn. Her mood took a turn for the better when she scanned the words of the letter to read. Just six more months and if I have not closed the case within that time, I will leave my job and come back to you, my dearest Sylvie. Thank you for listening to Amish Regrets. The next book in the Amish Secret Widow Society series is Book 5. Amish House of Secrets If you enjoyed this video, it would mean the world to me if you would like and subscribe to my channel. Each week I upload new videos and free, full-length audiobooks. So be sure to hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any new uploads. Until next time, thanks for listening.